I'm very mad at you about something, so. Did you publicly, like, did you have your publicist announce that you were going? Because I don't know how everyone knows, and now it's a huge story, and I'm actually pissed at you. Well, then I don't want you to go. A lot of people assume that I get jobs from my family, but it's actually kind of the opposite. It made me have to work even harder to get what I wanted. So I get scared that if my dad goes, that's kind of a media frenzy, and now it's kind of all blowing up. You're gonna take the biggest thing in my life and take it away from me? Thank you. No, you can't. You can come to the after party. You can't come. What do you say to those who accuse you of using your platform on the show to become a model, or that you didn't properly pay your dues? Okay, stop. Don't. Kendall, okay. this isn't a joke. You have to start taking this really seriously. Come on. I hope she's into this. Kendall, this isn't funny. Kendall cannot, from the start, act like this diva and really difficult to work with. No one's gonna want to work with her. I think, you know, everyone around me, whether it's friends or family, knows how hard I worked and still work. And let's try one more time. Head up. No, 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 no. Seriously, seriously, please. I start getting a little silly because I'm getting bored and I just kind of want to be done. And I did everything that I was supposed to do and had to do to get to the position that I'm at now as a model. Kendall? Kendall, where are you going? Kendall, I really don't want to be here right now. Stop embarrassing me. She wants to take it seriously one day? Okay, call me. I went to every single casting and ran all over not only New York City, but all over Europe trying to, you know, get a job and, and make my way. I have told you 500 times that I don't want to be doing this right now, and you just keep going on with these crazy things. You're honestly crazy right now. You're acting like a brat when you're not, like, you just walk out on meetings and you're not even doing, like, giving it your all. You need to start acting a little bit more professional. I came here for one reason, to go to the photo shoot, and now you took my fun away from me. What about the presentation tomorrow? You have your Sherry Hill thing that you're walking in. Cancel it, I'm going home. Of course, I had a platform, and I'll never, I never took that for granted I always knew that that was there but that almost made my job a little bit harder um, only because people you know probably didn't want to hire me because I was on a reality TV show I'm really nervous for my interview with Wilhelmina and I don't know what I'm gonna say we'll take some Polaroids we will email them off to a photographer of our choice mm -hmm. and then uh, set up a test shoot. Yeah, are your friends going to be jealous? I took my last name off of my name on like all my modeling cards so that I was taken completely seriously. So <laughs> I'm so excited that my sisters are at the show. It's always really nice to have my family in the audience. I mean, I literally like went to like the middle of nowhere castings. Like I'm at my Sherry Hill photo shoot and this is so exciting and so fun. Go. That's exactly how you would Beautiful. walk down the runway. I, I definitely worked my way to where I am now. I think it's just a perception that people have that I just was like, give it to me, and I had it. It definitely was not that. I got the Victoria's Secret fashion show. Nepo baby. Slang. Short for nepotism baby, and used to refer to someone who is the child or close relative of a successful individual, and who has ridden on the coattails of, or been advantaged to some extent by, said successful relative to gain their own wealth, success, or fame. Now while nepo babies can exist in pretty much any industry, in common parlance it mainly refers to the world of entertainment and celebrity. Example. Kendall Jenner, the highest paid supermodel in the world, who was helped to that top spot by internationally famous and wealthy family and their reality TV show, which has been running for over 15 years since Kendall was 11 years old. You grew up in this show, now you're the highest paid supermodel in the world. Um, it's, it's so crazy because I think that, um... Kendall Jenner modeling photos? It kind of happened really naturally, like I don't, I can't say I was like, you know, 10 years old dreaming about it, but when I did get to like 14, 15. Ever since I was seven years old, I've always dreamed of modeling. So I decided to put a book together to show it to my mom. I know it's kind of corny to say, but almost like destiny. Like I think that was what was pushing me that direction. Kendall's actually talked about wanting to be a model for a really long time. If this is what Kendall really wants to do, then I'm on board and I'll get the word out. Delusion, a false belief or judgment about external reality, held despite incontrovertible evidence to the contrary, occurring especially in mental conditions. Example, being Kendall Jenner and claiming that said rich and famous family, including megastar older sister Kim Kardashian, arguably one of the biggest cultural influences of the past couple of decades, have nothing to do with her becoming the highest paid supermodel in the world and have actually hindered her 
in some ways. But that almost made my job a little bit harder. Thank you, Kendall, for so exquisitely proving that living in LA does in fact cause more brain damage than hardcore meth addiction. And I like presented the yeah. cutest like little modeling book to my mom when I was like 14 and then she did her Kris Jenner things and made it all come to life. I, I want to talk about the Nepa baby topic because I have some points to bring up that I haven't heard anyone else talk about in relation to this topic and I also think I have some level of insight that I hope We'll make for a video that is um, a little more nuanced and touches on some things beyond a surface level. You know, rich parents equals success and that equals unfair and bad. This video is going to jump to a few places. I have lots to say on the stupidity of a lot of the statements Nepa babies have made about how, you know, they're apparently not privileged. Like, newsflash, no one believes that, you entitled lying little brats. But but later on, I'm going to, I'm going to uno reverse it and I'm going to defend the Nepo babies. How brave of me. Oh, I'm such a hero. Stay with me, don't don't let me lose you. Just see what I've got to say. And I am gonna roast the Napa babies as well because they have said some really stupid things. Look, wherever you think this video's going, it's probably not going that well. I don't know, maybe it is. Maybe you're, you, maybe you guessed. Maybe you got me. Maybe I'm not as complicated as I thought I was. Tragic. So let's get into this. We've got, we've got a costume and a fun background like I used to do before I started talking about the red pill. You know, back, back when there was joy in my life. Thanks, Rolo, for ruining it. Do you guys get it? I'll talk you through it. You didn't ask, I'm gonna tell you anyway. I'm a tragic starlet in her dressing room. Look, I'm adored. I've been sent lots of flowers by my many, my many admirers, but none of them know the real me. I've got another robe just in case I get bored of this robe. I got sent chocolates. The chocolates by a very wealthy patron. He comes to see my shows every night, but he still doesn't understand me. Nobody does. And I'm gonna die really young, tragically, tragically. But for the meantime, I'm very glamorous. And the more eagle-eyed of you may have noticed the most important detail. What's this? What's this hanging on? My... Is that, is that? Don't tell Vorsch but I think it might be stockings. <gasps> I think that I should get a stocking sponsorship. I would genuinely do that for good quality stockings. If anyone know, sto that would be so on brand for me. Come on, such a good full circle. Do you get, look how much effort I put into these. Oh, I'm so fabulous. But there's more. Oh, am I gonna explain to you the symbolism and ruin it? Yes, I am. Here's how it goes, okay? The robe represents generational wealth. The nightgown represents old Hollywood and fame. I don't know why it represents fame. Look, it represents fame because it's a nightgown and it's old Hollywood. Oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Dreams, I should have said dreams. That's what the nightgown represents. The nightgown represents dreams, which means your dreams coming true. Oh my God, makes so much sense. Okay, pretend I said that. The sleeping mask represents laziness and entitlement because of what it says on edgy. Might not get it. It's a highbrow sort of joke. Oh, this of course represents the inevitable substance abuse issues to numb me from the existential torture of never truly knowing. Do people love me for me or only for who my parents are? My life is so complex and difficult and glamorous. Ah! But luckily I've got drugs to make it all better. Just your standard Nepa baby starter kit. So everybody, welcome back to the channel. I am Galatea and this, yes, he is back. I know you guys missed him. This is Asus, my dearly departed. And today we'll be discussing the children of the rich and famous and their deliciously demented delusions. Asus is here because I couldn't do a video on celebrities without a rock star. I would just like to take a moment to thank him for being such a glowing example of a high value man. Hands down, the most stoic man in the red pill space. Look at him, look at him. Holding frame, being all calm and secure, not having public fucking meltdowns like apparently every other manosphere guy lately. I'm not too stubborn and walk back from it because the point of it was to get douche nozzles like yourself to 
have this conversation in the first place. How old are you, bro? <laughs> Douche nozzles? Yes. It's evident that you're used to women who don't check you when you're being irrational thanks. and way out of place. Th thanks for the whole synopsis on the 37 years of my it life. Shows. Uh... I don't want you to think I'm triggered by you. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I saw somebody say that, and I think that's interesting. I think you're annoying, but I'm not triggered. <laughs> you call yourself the godfather of the red pill. You I call myself the godfather of the manosphere, okay? okay? Other people have called me that. Okay, great. That's that is very... <laughs> As godfather that, or grandfather of the manosphere? Which one is it? Whatever it is, the old guy of the manosphere. Not, after okay. being treated like that? Absolutely not. I'm not going to be talked down to by, like, some child that, that has no decency to communicate with me in a respectful Can manner. You, it starts with you. What okay. man leads a relationship like that? You don't even have to be a general right. <laughs> Never, you have no fucking point. There's no point for either one of you to be on this fucking show. Quite honestly, <laughs> Dumbledore has spoken. You guys, you guys are better than me. You win. Cool. Next, uh, next okay. question. Amazing. Please. Anyway, not, you're so triggered, dude. Are you okay? Not very rational. I think. True. I think, uh, he should, his six like, month will be the like emotional male. I think. I think every, before you do, I got nothing to say. Come on. See, my point. But wait, yeah, you disagree with the, on it. with the Grandmaster, the Godfather, the great great granddaddy now of the Red Bull. And we're the ones that get He's our period. Hey, hey, here's, here's, here's a fun game. Do you guys remember when Rolo called me emotional? You know, for saying that women were equally capable of rational thought. Yeah, me too. I kept remembering that for some reason as I was watching the internet-wide tantrum he had in response to everyone clowning on him for being unable to rationally defend his positions. You guys are so mean, man. Yeah, what, look at all bro, I didn't even say- he, What do you mean we're mean? He called us douche nozzles. Oh, it's fine. He's the grand wizard of red pill, so I can't go say anything about that. But I'm mean now because I'm calling him irrational for not having any arguments at all. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, irony. I irony. You guys have no business being in this fucking sphere to begin with. First of all, okay. second of all, it keeps second, forever until you're sixty. Second of all, and the reason why is because you devolve into. You want to know why? Like when we talk, nobody debates anymore. Because you know why? Because it devolves into this middle school bullshit that both of you are. But you guys are perfect. Yes, you're you guys marry you each other. You can't call this childish when you were the one who started insulting. I would just ask you a question, and then you said douche nozzle. True. Now you're gonna go play the maturity card. Yeah, yeah, now I'm gonna play the maturity card. That was a middle school argument. This majestic lack of self-awareness is something Rolo shares with the Nepo baby population. The conversation around Nepo babies was reignited back at the beginning of this year with the publication of this New York Magazine article listing all the many people in the entertainment industry with famous parents. And the cover is... She has her mother's eyes and her agent. Even funnier, but though, apparently, I think it's the CEO or something of the magazine is also a Nepo baby because daddy bought the newspaper before she got the job, which is very on brand because as I've stated and will go on to prove, self-awareness is not something Nepo babies are known for. <laughs> um, yeah, so you may or may not be surprised to know that the title of this video is not clickbait. It's not. It's really not. So many Nepa babies are straight up delusional. I think you'll be shocked at the extent of it. Let's start with little Kenny J. Kardashian in essence, if not in name. Do you guys have any idea how hard she's had to work to become the highest paid supermodel in the world? Like, so, so, so hard. And people still have the perception that it's all been handed to her on a plate? I took my last name off of my name on like all my modeling cards so that I was taken completely seriously. I mean, I literally like went to like the middle of nowhere castings like i i definitely worked my way to where i am now i think it's just a perception that people have that i just was like give it to me and i had it it definitely was not that but where did this totally unfair and 100 percent wrong perception come from we'll take some polaroids <laughs> We will email them off to a photographer of our choice mm -hmm. and then uh, set up a test shoot. I'm at my Sherry Hill photo shoot and this is so exciting and so fun. <laughs> I'm so excited that my sisters are at the show. It's always really nice to have my family in the audience. I got the Victoria's Secret fashion show. If this is what Kendall really wants to do, then I'm on board and I'll get the word out. She did her Kris Jenner things and made it all come to life. Oh, uh, yeah, I can see how being on one of the most successful reality shows since you were a child, with a sister who's one of the most famous people in the world, born into one of America's wealthiest and most notorious families, and with one of the most ruthless, smart and savvy celebrity managers for a mother, may have given people the 
perception that breaking into the industry was easier for you than it would be for some random 16 year old from Lithuania. But of course that perception is just a perception and it is wrong. It is wrong because having that platform actually made your job, Kendall, a little bit harder. Of course I had a platform and I'll never, I never took that for granted. I always knew that that was there, but that almost made my job a little bit harder. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Let's stay realistic and grounded. Don't go overboard. We want to stay fair. It wasn't it wasn't massively harder for Kendall, but it, it was it was a bit harder. And that's something you should all be aware of when we consider if Kendall Jenner deserves to be where she is now. Just remember that she did have to work harder than all of those other girls to get there. Of course I had a platform and I'll never I never took that for granted. I always knew that that was there, but that almost made my job a little bit harder. Um, only because people, you know, probably didn't want to hire me because I was on a reality TV show. It breaks the heart to hear Kendall's story, it really does. Like, imagine trying to get into the modelling industry and having someone find out that your older sister is a world famous international sex symbol, fashion icon, and perfectly willing to take her clothes off to further her career. Oh my god, I would kill myself, it would be so embarrassing and definitely harm my job prospects in the modeling industry if if people thought I was anything like her. Pfft. Being a sexy cultural icon renowned as having no shame? Uh, oh, oh no! Those are the worst ways to sell any sort of product! <laughs> Who would buy anything associated with the Kardashians? Shut up, you idiot! You look, you look dumb right now, you look fucking dumb. She actually wouldn't allow us as a family to go to any of the fashion shows Why? and sit front row because she didn't want to be distracted. Or with, a film. Yeah. I took my last name off of my name on like all my modeling cards so that I was taken completely seriously. <laughs> I'm so excited that my sisters are at the show. It's always really nice to have my family in the audience. So I'm sorry, but obviously everyone would have known who Kendall was. Last name or no last name. She's been famous since she was a kid. And also nothing, nothing will convince me that Chris, the devil works hard, but she works harder. Jenna did not pull some strings at several points in Kendall's career. What do you say to those who accuse you of using your platform on the show to become a model or that you didn't properly pay your dues? Um, I mean, again, in like the in the topic of like offensiveness to some of the things that people I think assume about our family, I think, you know, everyone around me, whether it's friends or family, knows how hard I worked. Went to every single casting and ran all over not only New York City, but all over Europe trying to, you know, get a job and, and make my way. Do, do you guys remember when Kendall and Kylie wrote, wrote a young adult novel together and it became increasingly obvious during interviews that not only had the two girls not only not written their published novel, but they also clearly hadn't even read it. Allegedly, allegedly, in my opinion, that for legal reasons, I'm saying that. It's like a sci sci fi dystopia about um, the world after this huge catastrophe, and these two sisters on the journey throughout this new world. Originally, we kind of wanted to base the characters off of her and I, but um, we decided not to, and it, it kind of just they turned into turned into their own characters. So um, yeah. Sounds like I could make a good movie yeah. with the two of you starring in it. Why not? We'll see what happens. Ha! Just kidding. No ha! ha. They just got a book deal because they were that talented. Teenage girls are always offered publishing deals out of nowhere. Ooh! God, I am so glad that's not true. Literature would never survive. Yeah. I took my last name off of my name on like all my modeling cards so that I was taken completely seriously. I mean, I literally like went to like the middle of nowhere castings. Like I, I definitely worked my way to where I am now. I think it's just a perception that people have that I just was like, Give it to me, and I had it. It definitely was not that. Oh wait! Oh, oh, not something that not something that contradicts what Kendall just said there. This is it. What's this interview with Harper's Bazaar? What does this say? Let's have a read, shall we? To hear how hard it was for Kendall to break into the modelling industry. <coughs> Kendall Jenner made her Victoria's Secret fashion show debut in 2015, but she and her mother, Chris, were already making connections with the brand years before that. Kendall was only 15 when she told her mum it was her dream to become a Victoria's Secret angel someday, designer Tommy Hilfiger recalled in a conversation with Chris Jenner at WWD's CEO Summit. So the Kardashian matriarch did what she could to make her daughter's dream a reality. 
But there was a problem. She didn't really know anybody in the modelling industry, she revealed. Oh, that's so hard. Oh, it's so tense, isn't it? How will they ever overcome this problem? However, it was when she was on a flight home from New York that Chris found a way in. Jenna came across a documentary on renowned Victoria's Secret photographer, Russell James, whom she called the guy who could really discover Victoria's Secret models. When she got home, she researched him, somehow found his phone number and left him a voicemail where she told him about Kendall and asked to meet with him. Eventually, James did call her back. Chris and the family were having lunch with her mother in San Diego, while filming Keeping Up With The Kardashians, no less, oh, when the photographer returned her call. Oh my God, that, what a coincidence. Just as you're filming your reality show, it's really hard to get hold of. Icon in Victoria's Secret Photography World just, just, just happens to give you a ring as you're filming. Oh, 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 I hate cynical people. Oh, I just hate cynical people because I know what cynical people are going to say. Cynical people are going to say, oh, that's so staged. Oh, oh, I hate them, Kendall. They're so mean to you, aren't they? They're just going to be like, oh, that's obviously staged for the cameras for your reality show. I just think, I just think it's, I just think it's a wonderful coincidence. I think that's so magic that that happened just right when you're filming. Just, oh, just, it, it just so happens. Wow. Anyway, continuing. They set up a meeting with him and Kendall 10 days later at their house. He said, you're right, she's beautiful and I can't wait to work with her, Jenna said. James went on to shoot Kendall for his photography book, Angels, which was released the year before her Victoria's Secret runway debut. Could be a mistake, I'm just spoiling some inconsistencies here actually, Kendall. Weird, because Kendall, you told us that you tried to hide your family connections in order to get jobs and that you changed your last name. But here, actually, it seems to it seems it seems to be that you actually had one of the biggest photographers in the industry go over to your family home literally just because of who your mother is while they were filming your reality show. Obviously, just totally normal, though, because what I've definitely know to be true is that every 15-year-old aspiring model gets a personal house call from the Victoria's Secret photographer. God, I'm surprised you didn't do your back-in with all that running around to the middle of nowhere auditions, Kendall. Yeah, guys, don't be mean. No, don't, don't be mean, actually. It was literally harder for her because she was already so rich and famous. Oh, she literally had to change her name. Can you imagine having to hide who you truly are because you might be penalised for it? It hurts me how much she suffered, how much we all suffer, all of us tragic starlets who have to hide who we truly are. So here is something else worth saying, a little, a little tangent perhaps, but let's not forget, just gonna be, let's just be, let's just be honest about this, let's not forget that the Kardashians can afford, and could afford back then, many years ago, for a very long time, can afford plastic surgery and good surgery, the well done, hardly noticeable sort of surgery by the best in the business. This sounds mean, but it's actually relevant when talking about who can and can't be a supermodel. And I'm not being funny, but Kendall Jenner's face has morphed quite a lot in recent years. I don't know many of my friends who, from their teen years to their 20s, had their eyebrows change shape, lips get fuller, and nose get thinner. That is, that is fascinating how the Kardashians' faces just, like, they must have, like, really unique genes that just fucking change everything about how they look. Um, you know, and her, and her cheeks and stuff, to my eye, I could be wrong, but it looks like her cheekbones have somehow gotten a bit more just defined. It's amazing how, how that works. But, you know, all allegedly, I've got to say allegedly, because like all other Kardashians, Kendall says they've had, she's had no work done. They've all say they had, they've had no work done. And I would like to meet one actual real person who genuinely believes that. Also, in, in response, by the way, to people speculating about whether or not Kendall had plastic surgery, um, one of the things she said was, it's crazy. I feel like people just want me to lose. You know, because she's a tragic starlet. People just want her to lose. She's a tragic, she's a tragic starlet. It's crazy. I feel like people just want me to lose. I'm getting Gretchen Wiener vibes. I'm sorry that people are so jealous of me, but I can't help it that I'm popular. No, Kendall, that's not why people think you got surgery. Not because they're jealous or want you to lose, but because your face has magically transformed. And if there are two things you and your sisters are not known for, it's one, being natural, and two, being honest. And here we have um, Bella Hadid, just briefly to mention this, plastic, also, it might be time for a separate video, plastic surgery is absolutely rife 
in Hollywood and the amount, like everyone. Allegedly, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, but seriously, if you people like and subtle that that mm. anyway, Bella Hadid, another Nepa baby supermodel. You guys know the one. You know she's tragic. She's infamous for growing up poor. I never growing up had anything designer. You know my mom wouldn't let me. I think I got my first pair of. Louboutins when I graduated high school. Yeah, her parents are loaded, loaded enough to afford plastic surgery, which is helpful if you want to become a supermodel. Now, obviously this is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the modeling industry, particularly high fashion, has incredibly strict guidelines on how models should look. So being able to afford a way to better fit those standards will obviously give you an advantage. Not everyone can afford to change their face or body to be a model. On the other hand, while it's aided their careers, this is a fate I would not wish on anyone to grow up in a family where your parents not only allow you to have plastic surgery when you're underage, but actively encourage it. Bella Hadid famously had a nose job at age 14, which she now regrets. Stage mothers are honestly the worst. They, I was around a lot of them um, as a kid as well. And they, 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 they are the worst. They are the worst. They judge their children on their market value and how best you can sell that image to the public before seeing them as their unconditionally loved children. Or at least that's how it seems. Um, so in a way, I do feel quite sorry for Kendall Jenner and Bella Hadid and other, you know, poor little rich kids, tragic starlets, in other words, um, who grew up in the, those kinds of toxic environments. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be a Kardashian, constantly pitted against your sisters by your own mother slash manager, Val valued mainly on how you look and having to keep up with all the surgery allegedly everyone else in your family is getting um the, remember all of them the narrative all of them are natural yeah okay mm. um and being pushed into the public eye from a from a young age where there's constant scrutiny and having to live up to this impossible standard and as far as i can tell your whole life revolving around how beautiful and popular you are because it's the only way to win any kind of attention from your mother at least that's how it that's how it looks just as a casual viewer looking in. That being said, sure, that environment sucks. I wouldn't trade any kind of money or fame for that hellscape prison of a childhood. Mothers encouraging their children to get loads of work done really creeps me out. It seems so anti to what healthy maternal instincts and acceptance should be. However, if Kendall did get work done, if, 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 <laughs> that's quite an advantage in the modeling industry and something very out of reach for the average girl. Imagine being able to do that and still saying your family had nothing to do with your success? Audacious. Something else that springs to mind is the protection of the industry Nepo babies have. Now this is just pure speculation, but I'd guess they're a lot less likely to be victimized, tricked, exploited, and taken advantage of by the sharks of the industry. They're probably less likely to be harassed, I would guess. Less likely to be preyed upon. Less likely to lose their job if they don't want to sleep with someone. You know, because their family are powerful and will protect them. Do you know how predatory something like the modeling industry can be? Question, if you were a creepy weirdo who liked leveraging power over people and you're not fortunate enough to be Andrew Tate, where would you go for a constant supply of young, beautiful, naive, and probably poor young girls? You might get involved in the modeling industry where you hold in your hands the power to make or break their career. And in some cases, the power to get them out of poverty or throw them back into it. There are horror stories from the modeling industry. It is rife with exploitation. Most aspiring actresses, and particularly models, start in their teens. It's not hard to bully them. That's something else Nepa babies probably have over other girls. Power and protection and the knowledge that someone probably isn't going to treat you too badly or there might be repercussions from the family. You have a voice in the industry. You're harder to blacklist if you don't cooperate because you have many other connections and ways in. Um, I think that's something that shouldn't be underestimated. Even outside of something that dark, you still have, have protection in the industry that others don't have. Your parents probably know all about predatory contracts and bad business deals. That's someone to guide you. That is massive. Yeah, so I can't believe how out of touch you have to be to think it made your life harder and then actually say that in a televised interview. Can you see why I wasn't lying when I said delusion? It gets worse, there's more of them. Nepo baby isn't just a description, it's a state of being. It's a lifestyle, a mindset, an ideology, and there's loads of them. Yes, Kendall isn't the only Nepo baby desperate to separate herself from her family's success and claim she's done it all alone. So Lily Rose Depp 
debuted as a model at 15 years old and at 16, I believe, had her own Chanel campaign and received a shit ton of instant press for, yes, Lily, just being Johnny Depp's daughter. And I have to say, there's a couple of things I want to say. I think, I think, I personally think Lily Rose Depp is really very beautiful. Like, she's not the kind of person you look at and go, oh, she's clearly only a model because of her famous parents. I think she probably could have achieved some success in modelling without them. However, how many 16-year-olds um, have your own Chanel campaign? So yeah, here I'm going to read what some something that um, Lily Rose Depp said. This is just more evidence that Nepo babies don't truly understand their own advantages. Also, oh, also just to add to that, Lily Rose Depp is also an actress, or she's trying to break into acting at the moment. So about being a Nepo baby, Lily Rose Depp says, quote, the internet seems to care a lot about that kind of stuff. People are going to have preconceived ideas about you or how you got there. And I can definitely say, I like that she can definitely say this. I can definitely say that nothing is going to get you the part except being right for the part, she says. The internet cares a lot more about who your family is than the people who are casting you in things. Maybe you get your foot in the door, but you still just have your foot in the door. There's a lot of work that comes after that. I also think I'm not here to answer for anybody. And I feel like for a lot of my career, people have really wanted to define me by the men in my life. So tragic. Whether that's my family members or my boyfriends, whatever. Sounding confident and somewhat defiant at the same time, she added, and I'm really ready to be defined for the things that I put out there. Lily Rose Depp's parents, Johnny Depp and Vanessa Paradis, certainly helped their daughter in the early stages of her career, but she says it hasn't been easy. No. Followed up by this line, after landing her first roles in films featuring her dad, Tusk and Yoga Hoses, she says she's had to work even harder to prove that she isn't just the child of a famous person. Yeah, imagine saying breaking into the industry hasn't been easy and that nothing is going to get you the part except being right for it. Meanwhile, your first roles were in movies your dad, A-list megastar Johnny Depp, was also in. Audacious. How many first-time actresses get to be in a movie with someone like Johnny Depp? Nepo baby syndrome is a serious condition where the sufferers are born without a self-awareness gene. It, it continues. It is obviously a really easy assumption to make to think that I would just have roles landing on my doorstep because of my name. But that's an idea I've always kind of rejected. I've always been under the impression that I had to work twice as hard to prove to people that I'm not just here because it's been easy for me. I feel like you're not what your name is. If you're not right for something, they're not just going to hire you because your name looks good on the post, she told Australian Vogue. Yeah, I like how she phrases this. Not that the, not that the assumption's wrong, just that she, she rejects it. Like, it's an idea that she, she's kind of rejected. No, I, I, don't, I don't feel like it. I, I, I feel like my name doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just gonna reject it. Yeah, I'm always I'm under the impression that I have to work twice as hard. So this is why it's a delusion. Can you hear the delusional language? That's nice. That's a nice story that she tells herself. That's lovely. That's you're lovely that we get to hear your internal monologue and justifications, Lily, for why you are where you are. But you know, it's not actually accurate, is it? So when I said that, there was a couple of things that I didn't realize. The first thing is that apparently Lily Rose Depp is only five foot three. I I, st I still stand by what I said. Like I think she's very beautiful, but it doesn't. If you, she's short, that's my point, she's short. Um, which for a model, like, I don't know, I'm just kind of a bit blown away and baffled by the fact that, so her looks aside, just the fact that she's short would massively hamper in the modeling industry. I just can't, I, I, I think that's a massive factor to mention. I think the fact that she even had a career in the modeling industry in the first place, being the height that she is, is probably only because of her parents, if I'm honest. Um, and the other thing is, so apparently, um, I just, because I was Googling a few things, looking at this article. H here's the other silly thing. So Lily Rose Depp closed the Chanel fashion show. Apparently she's closed the Chanel fashion show twice. Um, she, and, and back in 2017, she was the final bride, basically. So she closed the Sp Chanel Spring 2017 show. And for me, like, I mean, I'm not massively in the fashion world. I, I know a fair bit about it. I'm fairly interested in fashion. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not a fashionista or whatever, okay? But... People don't know, like, that's a big deal. That's a big deal to close a fashion show. And at the time, and I don't know how, you know, accurate, like, the internet is and whatever for this stuff, but I think she was about 18 years old at the time. So that's like, oh, I just, I don't know, I just feel like I can't explain this to people who aren't, um, but the fact that she's five foot three, and then when she's 18 years old, to close a show just to me speaks volumes about the fact that what other five foot three model who's only 18 and hasn't established herself 
in the industry is closing a Chanel fashion show. So Kendall Jenner as well, apparently also, went in, here in the same article, I don't know how accurate this is, but this is just going off what this article is saying. It says that Kendall Jenner also, right when her career started to take off, she also closed Chanel's um, pre-fall 2015 show. So alongside Cara Delevingne. It just seems so obvious to me. Why would, oh, why would designers do this? They would choose the best model. Yeah, and it's not like these girls are like necessarily like terrible models or anything, you know, they're, they're perfectly, f but it's the fact that like the reason why designers would choose celebrities or children celebrities to close their fashion show is because guess why? Because they get press. They get press from it. So to suggest that, you know, your status in the industry and the status of your parents has nothing to do with the fact you were selected and it's just on your talent alone is ridiculous, especially if you're five foot three and 18 years old and haven't really done much. And then as a runway model, you, you, like, it's just, I don't know. Do people get in what I'm saying? It's just really rare that that would happen. I think Kate Moss was short, but she's... Apparently Kate Moss was five foot seven, which is still taller than Lily Rose Depp and was still considered short for a model. Um, some sources do say Lily Rose Depp is five foot five, but either way, whether she's five three or five five, that's still short for a model. Not impossible to get into modeling, not impossible to even get on the runway, not impossible to even become like a superstar supermodel, but very, very difficult. And I just, yeah, I mean, I just don't think it would be that achievable for her if she wasn't who she was. Here's the thing, look, okay, and we'll come to this later. I'm not saying that all Nep babies aren't talented. Um, necessarily. Okay, look. What she said there, because she said earlier she, she wouldn't like to be defined, she doesn't like being defined by the men in her life, and she, she's ready, she's ready to be defined for the th things that she put out there, and blah blah, all this. Okay. But this is bl both a blessing and a curse. The glamour of Nepo babies, right? People love talking about them for the same reason people loved Gossip Girl. It's the opposite of an underdog. The underdog stories are inspiring, yet emotionally quite heavy. This stuff, Gossip Girl, the, the Nepo Baby, the, this, it's watching people behave outrageously with no real world consequences. Watching them indulge in luxury to the point of obscenity. It's pure escapism. The fantasy of being born into a famous, influential, wealthy family just seems a lot more fun than having to work your way up and live in a shitty apartment and perhaps lose some of your old friends or family in the process of rising as you leave them behind. Like, I get it. I loved Gossip Girl back in the day. Watching modern day empires and families live lives of designer and holidays and being fabulous without the stress of having to work hard, um, or at least in the way that we think of that, you know, um, and the grime and depression of a rough background. So Lily Rose Depp can't really complain about people defining her by that, or by people caring more about female Nepo babies. I didn't put it in there, but she does complain about people caring more about female Nepo babies than they do about male Nepo babies. And I don't think she's wrong, I think that's right. But that's both a good and a bad thing for the female Nepo babies. There's Two sides to it. The very thing you're irritated by is the very same thing making you famous and the reason people are talking about you. Yeah, maybe people give female nepo babies a worse time than male nepo babies and they make a bigger deal out of it, but also in general, female, female nepo babies seem to be more talked about, more glamorous, people care about them more as well. Yeah, the very thing you're irritated by is the very same thing making you famous and the reason people are talking about you. There are drawbacks to everything and I'm sure being defined by who your dad is can be annoying in a lot of ways, but it's also why people gave a shit in the first place. So perhaps don't fucking complain about it because for everyone who wishes they were in that position, it's incredibly fucking annoying to hear and it's hard to dredge up an ounce of sympathy if I'm honest. I just wanna roll my eyes at you, Lily. Like, this is the thing, you're sort of, you're a real life Serena Vander Woodson, in essence. And the main draw of Serena is her glamorous rich girl life and background. She's a modern day princess. That's what makes you an it girl, Lily. And look, no one's saying that if you build up a career on your own and can stand by your own achievements that you shouldn't ask to be respected for your talents as well. However, let's not forget where you came from. And to be honest, at 24 years old and with not a huge amount of note, you know, and with not a huge amount of anything of note really behind you, I don't think we're quite at the stage where you can so confidently request people stop thinking of you first and foremost as Johnny Depp's daughter. That's a really good problem to have. Like, I don't think you would like what would happen if people stopped defining you by your dad. At least not at this stage. I think you would stop getting roles and people would stop caring as much. Um, until you build up enough of... If you, until you prove yourself enough. And then people start hiring you for you and caring about who you are. And at that point, then, then I think that happens naturally, that you earn that. So Vittoria Soretti, a self-made supermodel, had a response which attests to this. This is what Glamour magazine reported about Victoria. 
Um, and people guessed this was in response to Miss Lily Rose Depp, My Dad Didn't Help Me, but also my first movies were with him. So Victoria supposedly said that she would like to see if a certain Nepo baby could have lasted through the, f lasted through the first five years of my career. So quote, I just want to share a thought here because I can. I bumped into an interview of a so-called Nepo baby or whatever y'all call it. I can't say y'all in this accent, it doesn't work. She began her Instagram stories post. While Soretti conceded that the Nepo baby in question has probably faced some rejection, the model pointed out that their privilege and family connections have likely cushioned any blow. Quote, you can tell me your sad little story about it. Even at the end of the day, you can still always go cry on your, your dad's couch in your villa in Malibu. But how about not being able to pay for your flight back home to your family, waiting hours to do a fitting slash casting just to see a Nepo baby walk past you from the warm seat of his slash her Mercedes with her slash his driver and her slash his friend slash assistant slash agent taking care of her slash his mental health, she continued. You have no fucking idea how much it takes to make people respect you. It takes years. You just get it for free day one. The model concluded... I have many Nepo baby friends whom I respect, but I can't stand listening to you compare yourself to me. I was not born on a comfy, sexy pillow with a view. I know it's not your fault, but please appreciate and know the place you came from. Yeah, I would guess that Victoria also probably doesn't believe that Kendall Jenner just ran all across New York to try to get to auditions. Now we have Kaya Gerber. So... Quoting here, in a recent interview with Elle, the 21 year old model spoke of the privilege she has experienced being born in her position. Quote, I won't deny the privilege that I have, even if it's just the fact that I have a really great source of information and someone to give me great advice. That alone I feel very fortunate for, she said. Gerber continued, my mum always joked, if I could call and book a Chanel campaign, it would be for me and not you. But I have also met amazing people through my mum who I now get to work with. With acting, it's so different, said Gerber. No artist is going to sacrifice their vision for someone's kid. That just isn't how art is made, and what I'm interested in is art. Also, no one wants to work with someone who's annoying, and not easy to work with, and not kind. Yes, nepotism is prevalent, but I think if it was actually what people make it out to be, we'd see even more of it. Says Kaya Gerber, the daughter of supermodel Cindy Crawford. Right, here's something interesting. Lily Collins, daughter of Phil Collins, um, said, which points to the prevalence of Nepo babies and makes Kaya's statement, which was by no means terrible, just seem a little tone deaf. Quoting here from an article. She told Marie Claire UK, When I first met with agents, I was asked, Well, what makes you so special? Everybody in LA is a cousin or daughter of someone. At the beginning, that was the most interesting, uh, interesting thing about me. She continued, Now I've done eight films, it's an afterthought. I get kids who say, Oh, I love your movie, but my mum loves your dad. It's really nice to be able to share that with him, but it doesn't define who I am career-wise. Yeah, so here's the problem, I think, because it seems to be in Hollywood, a lot of Nepo babies competing against Nepo babies, and they think, you know, oh, having a famous parent doesn't help because everyone has a famous parent and we all have to compete. Sure, but ironic you're not seeing the fact that because so many of you are related to someone, maybe it's mostly only you guys who even got into the position to compete in the first place. You're competing with other Nepo babies, so you think that being a Nepo baby doesn't help, wah, tragic startup. Um, which begs the question, where are all the non-Nepo babies? A lot of them probably not even there in the first place. But we're going to come back to that because I don't want this, to, This the point of this is not that you have to have famous parents to be famous. No, I don't believe that either. No, we're not doing that. But it does help. So Emma Roberts, former icon of the early 2000s teen movie, is the niece of Julia Roberts, the superstar darling of the 90s rom-com. Here's what she had to say a few years ago about her elite Hollywood family connections. Quote, A lot of people think that, and they talk about nepotism, which I think is so ridiculous, considering it's obviously not true, because I've auditioned for so many things and never gotten the part, she tells Pop Eater. Also, it's like, you know, maybe someone can get you one part, but they can't really get you ten parts. This was years ago, to be fair to her, but it's still bad, and I think at that point she was still old enough to know better. Right. Imagine being so out of touch and privileged that you think a family member being able to get you only one part and not ten isn't a big deal. Oh, 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 sorry, was the one part in a movie not good enough for you, Emma? How many are there? Thirty-six. Counted them myself. Thirty-six! But last year, last year I had thirty-seven! Also, getting that one part can lead to another part. And another. And another. 
like, so what that you auditioned for loads of things and never got the part? You got lots of other parts. Are you guys sensing a running theme? Because I am. Nepo babies not understanding the world they live in. Like, Kaya going on, it's, it's different with acting. It, it's not different with acting. Sure, if you truly suck, it's unlikely you'll go anywhere. But even having some measure of talent, you'll be fine. No one will sacrifice their vision for someone's kid. Sure, Kaya, I agree. But would they prioritize that kid over someone with equal talent who didn't have a famous parent? Would that kid be more likely to even end up in the position of being considered for a movie over someone else? Maybe it will just get your foot in the door, but that could be the difference between nothing and everything. So many of these Nepo babies seem truly unable to understand how their position is helping them if they can't see the direct benefit. And it's indirect benefit that I want to go on to really talk about in this video, the intangible, because this is something I always see left out of the conversation and that Nepo babies just seem frankly incapable of understanding. Firstly though, I would like to debunk a certain Nepo babies rant about the Nepo baby conversation just being about people being mean. Um, which I don't think is true, because I think what most people really hate are the out-of-touch responses and attitude more than they are annoyed at Nepo babies just existing. I saved one of the most unhinged and hypocritical responses for last. And of course, that honour goes to Jamie Lee Curtis. Here is what Jamie Lee Curtis posted on Instagram. Quote, I have been a professional actress since I was 19 years old, so that makes me an OG Nepo baby. I've never understood, nor will I, what qualities got me hired that day, but since my first two lines on Quincy as a contract player at Universal Studios, to this last spectacular creative year some 44 years later, there's not a day in my professional life that goes by without my being reminded that I am the daughter of movie stars. The current conversation about Nepo babies is just designed to try to diminish and denigrate and hurt. Aww. For the record, I have navigated 44 years with the advantages my associated and reflected fame brought me. I don't pretend there aren't any um, that try to tell me that I have no, had no value on my own. I, I don't, okay, I'm kind of getting what you're saying. It's curious how we immediately make assumptions and snide remarks that someone related to someone else who is famous in their field for their art would somehow have no talent whatsoever. I have come to learn that that is simply not true. I have suited up and shown up for all different kinds of work with thousands of, uh, thousands of people, and every day I've tried to bring integrity and professionalism and love and community and art to my work. I am not alone. There are many of us dedicated to our craft, proud of our lineage, strong in our belief in our right to exist. She ends it with be kind, be kind, be kind in capital letters. Um, okay. Jamie, chill the fuck out. You're not Nelson Mandela. You're not a persecuted underclass, all right? Can we just take a few deep breaths and gain a bit of perspective? Nobody is trying to run the Nepo babies out of Hollywood. Trust me, we couldn't. Your parents are doing the hiring. You're all fine. My absolute favourite quote in this, by the way, is when she unironically said in defence of Nepo babies, there are many of us. Yes, we know. That's why this conversation is happening. And some of you are talented, but not all of you. Look, and maybe it's true. Maybe it's true, although although I, I don't believe this. But maybe for every day of her 44 year career, she has had someone remind her that she's the daughter of movie stars. I mean, that sounds like such bullshit, but okay, Jamie, even if that's true, sure, that's probably annoying, but at least you're there in the first place to get annoyed by it. I'm sure the many talented actresses without famous parents and who never made it in Hollywood are wishing they had your problems. Honestly, this whole thing just reads like something an out of touch 22 year old trying to be a social justice warrior would post on Instagram. Very embarrassing for a woman of your age, Jamie. It smacks more than a little of playing the victim and making it all about you during a general conversation people are having where they point out the irrefutable fact that those with famous parents are more likely to succeed in Hollywood. I can't believe you feel attacked by that. As far as I can see, your name hasn't been brought up a huge amount. The main criticisms seem to be levelled at the younger actors, and you've more than proven yourself capable and talented over your career. So this outburst reads as a little insecure and very out of touch. Frankly, I don't think that Jamie Lee Curtis is that bothered by the Nepo Baby conversation. I think she's way more bothered by the fact that she's not the Nepo Baby people care about, so she has to remind everyone that she's a Nepo Baby too, with, you know, the 
I am not alone. Like inserting herself to, into a conversation that I don't think anyone really was including her in in the first place. I'm going to say something very mean now, but it's also very true. When people talk about Nepo babies, we all mean people like Lily Rose Depp and Kendall Jenner because they're culturally relevant it girls and everyone wants to know everything about them, whether they love them or hate them, because the young, the rich and the beautiful have always been figures of interest and glamour. When someone says Nepo baby, who thinks of Jamie Lee Curtis? Literally no one. She's in her 60s. Who is actually on a movie set saying to her face, you're only here because of daddy. What? Genuinely, I, I think that's I think I think that's a lie. Your parents were famous back in the fucking 50s, Jamie. No one cares. Most young people probably don't even know who they were. There's a reason they're called Nepo babies and not Nepo people. Right, love? Look, the thing is, I'm not like that that was hard. I'm not trying to insult her. It's actually a compliment to Jamie that she's not at the center of the conversation. She's not an unproven starlet. She's achieved a level above that, as people do when they come to the end of a very successful career. Sure, you're not the hot, hot young thing anymore, but you have something more valuable and longer lasting. For someone like Curtis, who complains about the worshipping and obsession with youth, she sure doesn't seem very secure in the undeniable value and position of earned deference older people bring. You've got a legacy, a gravity and distinction. You're a figure deserving of respect and with knowledge, experience and a weight to your words that silly young Nepo babies haven't earned yet, no matter how temporarily interested people are in them. Don't ruin that gravitas. You've already proven yourself. Hardly anyone is doubting if you've earned your seat at the table at this point. Let the conversation move on without you, secure in the knowledge you've earned your stripes. Instead, this outburst reeks of washed up syndrome. To be honest, comes off as insecure, and I think, if anything, is disrespectful to herself. Also, knowing some of the things that Jamie has said in the past, I would like to know if her reaction would be similar if the conversation was about men or white people having an unfair advantage in Hollywood. Would she be running to their defence in that case? Would she? Would she claim a conversation about privilege in that instance was only designed to hurt and denigrate and that they should all be proud of their lineage and strong in their belief in their right to exist? I would love to see her defend the Hollywood privilege of straight white men in the exact same words. No. But of course, she would not be that consistent and try to stop a conversation about unfair advantages if it was going in that direction. I bet she would jump down the throat of anyone who tried to defend themselves while also tweeting a long list of reasons being a woman has been a hindrance to her in the movie industry. And you can try and argue against this if you like, but I think everyone knows that it is absolutely more of an advantage in Hollywood to have a famous parent than it is to be straight, white or male, particularly in current year. I think the evidence speaks for itself. Every white guy in a trailer park absolutely fuming right now that he didn't get a movie deal as a teenager like Jamie did. The Nepo baby transcends petty human distinctions. Zoe Kravitz, Willow Smith, Dan Levy and John, John David Washington, just as a selection, proving that the Nepo baby knows no race, no gender, no nationality, no sexuality. Wholesome. The Nepo baby brings people of all colours and creeds together, united in their access to daddy's money. Maybe the Nepo baby is the unlikely hero that will heal the world. This could be what the Bible talked about. They're like, what is this? What is this response, Jamie? Strong in our belief in our right to exist? Are people saying you can't exist? What else are the voices saying, Jamie? What a bizarrely defensive response to people pointing out that you had more of an advantage than others. Of course you did. That doesn't mean that you aren't talented or hardworking or deserving. But let's not pretend that you came from the same place as someone with no industry contacts or formal training or knowledge of how it works. And I guess she kind of did a little bit try to acknowledge that, but also not really and failed epically. I don't think the current conversation around Nepo babies is designed to hurt, as Jamie says. Most people are just pointing out that a lot of people had head starts and then getting mad when Nepo babies deny it. It's when you say something stupid that most people smell blood and go for your throat myself included. Do you want to know the Nepo babies that no one is mad at because they just own where they came from and are sensible and honest about it? Maya Hawke, the daughter of Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke, had a great response and she seems to be fine. As far as I can see, she's not getting any crap for anyone. 
Quote, I'm very grateful for the fact my parents made it so easy for me to do the thing that I love. I think I'll get a couple chances on their name and then if I suck, I'll get kicked out of the kingdom. And that's what should happen. So I'm just going to try not to suck. Very grand response that has the ring of gratitude to it. Truly, I think that's all it takes to placate most people. I don't have a problem with Maya. She seems cool. Great, grand response, p awesome. Bono's daughter, Eve Hewson, also had a funny response where she just tweeted, actually pretty devastated I'm not featured in the Nepo Baby article. Like, haven't they seen my hit show, Bad Sisters? The nerve. Yeah, all the Nepo babies need to ask Maya Hawke and Eve Hewson for PR training because that's how you respond. Hewson's response is great. She didn't make a big deal out of it. She didn't prostrate herself and apologize for being born to who she was, um, which is equally cringy in a different way. If anyone wants to apologize, if anyone wants you to apologize for things you can't control, ignore them, those people suck. She just made a funny tweet, which was brilliant in that it made it not a big deal. It acknowledged that she was a Nepo baby. The fact she wasn't angry or defensive implies she knows that she's lucky and advantaged. And it was also self-deprecating, making fun of herself and the fact she's not hugely well known yet, which implies that she's grounded and isn't taking herself too seriously or has delusions of grandeur. She doesn't think she's the shit because of who her dad is, basically, is the vibe from that. Um, it was also honest and upfront, pointing out that she's a Nepo baby before anyone else could. I know I'm talking a lot about a short, silly tweet, but it was genuinely a beautifully constructed response. She covered her back, defended herself, was unashamed of where she came from, while also implicitly acknowledging that she has been lucky. If any celebrity is in a PR disaster, call her. 10 out of 10, flawless execution. We're going to go to a weird place that will tie in and make sense as this video progresses, I promise. So let's go back to when Vorshi Boy basically accused me of being born with a silver spoon in my mouth and living a lifestyle comparable to internationally best-selling almost billionaire author JK Rowling, an assumption he made purely, yes purely, because of my accent, and he's a heathen American who thinks all English people were invented by Downton Abbey and all live in castles. I think he might have even accused me of having servants at one point. Um, which was even fucking funnier when it turned out he's a Beverly Hills rich kid and at one point in my life my family was struggling so much to get by, we were on the dole. Um, now that's what I call projection from an incredibly wealthy and hating himself for it socialist. The only reason I'm mentioning Vorsch here is in case people have seen that video and go, wait, in that video, you said you've only known poverty. No, that's not what I said, go back and watch it. Um, and I stated very clearly in that video um, that I'm more than anything grateful for my education, my mainly scholarship funded education. And I've experienced being in my life, in my life I've experienced being both extremely rich when I was very young, extremely poor, for a fair few years and then existing in a middle ground, all right? So I'm just saying that just in case people are confused and don't understand why now I'm talking about the world of wealth and privilege, when I've also said at points my family worried about affording food and rent, both are true. So I think this background is going to be what makes this video interesting, hopefully, let's see, um, because having had a foot in both camps and experienced both things, I have a different perspective, I think, on this topic um, from a lot of people. I have, I have something of an outsider view into the world of the privileged, I'm used to it and I understand it, but I'm also a little removed. Okay, I, I'm, uncom I'm uncomfortable talking about this actually, um, but I think, it, I think it adds needed context to what I'm gonna go on to talk about. So very briefly, here are the types of schools that I went to. And you're going to be wondering why I'm rambling about my education, but it's for context for the things I'm going to go on to talk about. So when I was a very little kid, really before the age of six, um, I went to an all girls private school in Newcastle, a lot of kids there were the kids of footballers, very flash and wealthy, and this was when my family had money. Age of six, family no longer had money, there was minus money, so from age of six to 13, I went to a very small local hippie school, um, and though it was technically a private school, because it was, yeah, technically a private school, but because it was also a very hippie school, they had this thing where parents would only pay what they could afford, and lots of people paid like virtually nothing, hardly anything at all. Um, so it wasn't like a proper private school. Lots of the kids there were from very poor families. It was also a tiny school, averaging maybe 20 kids in a year. My year was always, always really tiny. The most we ever had was 14 people. And the least we ever had was five. Um, four after I left. <laughs> so I was there until age 13. And I'm telling you this so you understand the culture shock I had going from this raggedy little hippie school, um, that's not an insult, I loved that school, to at age 13, then going to a very traditional Catholic boarding school, an English public school, what it's known as. Brief explanation of what a British public school is. 
I'm trying not to make this too long, but this is important information. So in America, for example, a public school is state funded and a private school is fee paying where wealthy kids go. In the UK, a state school is state funded, a private school is fee paying and a public school is one level up from that, like the top of the top of private schools. Highly elite, mostly boarding, traditionally catering to aristocracy. It's where most British politicians go to school. For a lot of these schools, there are entrance exams and they are incredibly expensive. Did they go to a good school? Eton, St Paul's, Westminster. Harrow, if you have to. Mm. So this includes famous schools like Eton, Harrow, Bedells, Gordonston, Marlborough, places where royalty go. The now King Charles went to Gordonston, Prince Harry and William went to Eton, Kate Middleton went to Marlborough, Princess Margaret's son went to Beedells. Don't ask me why they're known as public schools. In brief, it's because the students weren't bound by location, because um, it's like massively boarding, so like they mean public versus local, um, but Google it if you're interested. Okay, this feels so awkward explaining this, but I promise this will tie back into Nepo Babies and Kendall Jenner at some point, and you'll understand why I'm doing this. I, I also feel kind of weird in case my old school friends are watching this. It's fine, no one be weird, no one make this weird. It's not weird, don't make it weird, okay? Right, so from the ages of 13 to 16, I went to a Catholic public school, which had the sort of pupils who go on to do incredibly well in business or politics or inheriting things, you know, all that jazz. And I'm just going to say this, this is totally irrelevant to everything, but when people hear that I went to a monastery run Catholic boarding school, they expect me to have hated it or that I found it filled with snobs. Um, sorry to disappoint, but I absolutely loved it there. And yeah, there are a few people who were prats, but there are prats everywhere. The vast majority of people that were there, and particularly people I'm still in touch with, are genuinely lovely people that I feel lucky to have in my life. I'm just not a fan of the assumed dislike that a lot of people have for my old school friends and the kind of people they assume them to be without knowing anything about them. Especially when it's someone like Rich Kid Vorsch implying it. Yes, I have met genuine elitist snobs before, but most people aren't caricatures who sit around feasting on peasants in real life. So anyway, at 16 years old, I got a scholarship to Beedells, another public school, but a very different type of public school. Beedells is famous for catering, not necessarily to the incredibly posh, but to like the bohemian famous set. Um, the opposite of traditional, it's very liberal, arty place. We call teachers by their first names and we didn't have a uniform. Um, it's a school with a sometimes bad reputation for sex, drugs and rock and roll. They have the sort of pupils who go on to do incredibly well in media, in acting, um, music, and lots of celebrities send their children there. Think less old money country aristocrat, like my previous school, and more famous arty London lovey. Welcome to modern wank. Oh, this is amazing! Thanks. It's full of modern wank. So I was only there at that school for a year, and at 17 I switched again for my last year of school. This time I went to a normal local state college. Not an American type of college, a British college, which means the last two years of school. So it's not university, it's different. Okay, so you, so you, one could say that I've had a somewhat varied education. All types, with all types of kids. I, I've actually yet to meet anyone with as varied an educational experience. Okay, but, but these two public schools in the middle, those two public schools in the middle is what I'm really going to draw on for this video. The other places was just to give you context so you understand my point of contrast. So that's the two types of public schools I've experienced. The two types of privilege, I suppose we could say. The first being an old money, traditionalist, business, slash politics, slash titles sort of school. And the second being, daddy's a rock star. No, literally. So both of those schools I went to were actually parodied in the 2007 movie St Trinian's, um, where the girls cheat at school challenge. I'll play the clips because it actually shows the difference quite well. Where with Ampleforth, because it's a Catholic school and used to be all boys, obviously wasn't when I went there, um, they showed them as losing because the St Trinian's girls flirted with them and they couldn't handle it. Um, Cause I guess Catholics was the joke, I don't know. And with Beedells, because there have been a couple of drug scandals. How are we gonna beat Beedells? Magic. Kind you get in mushrooms. Full of drug scandals, and the school is known for being very arty and, you know, peace and love, man. Hi. I love caramel tea. <laughs> they took the piss out of that by having the most hippie looking St. Trinian's girl spike them with magic mushrooms. Yes, Chaz, be dead. Was it Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> Casper. Are you buzzing, Casper? Oh, yeah. 
So I completely misremembered that. They did have ample force in there, but they also had a girl on the team. And with them, I think they just cheated with it. This is totally relevant to the video, but this is just from St. Julian's movie. Um, but they, yeah, they just cheated with them by having like, I think, earpieces where they had the answers. I'm sorry to say, Ampleforth College, we have to bid farewell to you for the series. Lisa! 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 Um, and then the school where they flirted with, with them to distract the boys was Eton. Oh, come on, Eton. Which makes a lot more sense, actually, because that is still all boys, and the Eton boys, I think, have something of a reputation, so there we go. Leave Eton. This is relevant for context, so you understand the environment I'm talking about and what I feel were the most important things I gained from it. Beedells in particular, as I said, not only produced celebrities, but lots uh, lots of their kids went there um, and have historically gone there. I'm not, I'm not gonna say who when I was, because that, that would be a bit like very cringe and tasteless. Um, I, I was at school with some of them, but you probably recognize their, well, you would recognize their parents' names. So the school basically is known for birthing brand new famous people and also educating the offspring of current famous people. So I'm not, I'm not gonna name, I'm not gonna do that. What I will do, however, is list some well-known alumni who attended either one of those schools. Very tacky of me, I know. Nobody likes a name dropper. I'm turning into Rolo. At least I'm not bragging about texting any of them. Um, but, but look, this is to make a point. Okay, I promise that I promise there is an incoming point that isn't just like a weird bragging attempt. And this doesn't feel like exploiting people I used to know because all of these people are older than me and we weren't at school at the same time. So I feel like this isn't as weird. Okay, so here's a selection of a few. So this is across those two schools. This is across those two schools that I went to. Okay, this is weird. Um, here we go. Daniel Day-Lewis, Lily Allen, Kirsty Allsop, Julian Fellows, the writer and creator of Downton Abbey, Alice Eve, Rupert Everett, Colin Firth, James Norton, Jamie Campbell Bower. Yes, I realise the irony of having been to the same school as the guy who played my most hated fictional character of all time in a movie. Fuck you, Jace. Plot twist, everyone. Mini Driver, Luke Pritchard from The Cooks, Anthony Gormley, Lawrence Delalio, Barty Crouch, his actor, not the actual character, obviously, Juno Temple, Cara Delevingne, Poppy Delevingne, and, apparently, Jack Whitehall's dad. Also, apparently, Joe Strummer um, from The Clash, which, not very rock and roll of you, Joe. Although, I heard that, that he, he went to one of those sc the schools briefly. Um, then I, I, but then I'm not sure, because I, then I looked into it and I was like, I don't know, I can't, but anyway, okay. Um, and yes, Juno Temple, who went to Beedells, also plays the hippie girl in St. Trinian's, who sabotages Beedells, so I bet the writers thought they were funny for that one. So. Those are mainly just actors and a few other types of famous people. That's not including politicians, business people, bankers and finance people, tech, fuck, I don't know, producers probably, God knows what else. Don't forget the international mafia. You think I'm kidding? Uh, I'm not kidding. Mafia need to send their kids to school somewhere too, and a lot of them like the idea of a traditional English education. So, when I was looking at schools as well, I just found this image online. I'm assuming it's old Etonians, old people who went to Eton. Obviously I didn't go to Eton because it's an old boys school, but yeah, the, the, to just um, re-emphasize my point again, that is just, I'm assuming these are all, yeah, old Etonians. So I'm just stress my point even more. Are you starting to see how this is tying into the nepotism topic? Firstly, I have a disclaimer. That doesn't mean it's necessarily been easy for all of those people to achieve, to achieve success. It doesn't mean if you haven't been to one of those schools that you're disqualified from becoming successful or famous, especially nowadays. It also doesn't mean that if you have been to one of those schools, you're guaranteed success and fame. God knows how many pupils have passed through those schools and only a small minority of them make it big. But what it does show is that if those were two other ordinary British schools, that list of famous people to be produced by those schools, though not impossible, would defy the laws of probability. So for all the Nepo babies who say famous parents didn't help, I don't believe you, because even having the right sort of education seems to have some obvious effect. Add a famous parent onto that and you're golden. The people I listed don't all have famous parents, a lot of them just moved in influential or aspirational circles because of the schools they went to. You know, but how many normal schools in the UK can claim to have had that many famous alumni as those two? So even if you took two normal schools in the UK, how about 20? I take 20 random normal secondary schools in Britain to my two. Uh, are we likely to see a list like that? There'll be some, of course there will be some, but that many? And again, I stress, these are only the obviously famous and successful people. There's plenty in other industries or in the same industry just behind the scenes. Now, some of you might hear that and think, oh my God, you go to that school and you're in. You know, you're in that world, you're automatically successful, every door opens for you and everything is easy. 
and that's not what I'm saying. Um, also, the, the intention here is not to make anyone feel like success if you're not a Nepo baby is impossible. I think that's a very harmful and self-defeating attitude, and I'll talk more about it later. But obviously, there's some advantage. I'd like to give my take on what that is, coming from my own experience. There are a few reasons why we see a disproportionate amount of public school kids achieve success compared to the general population. The first is probably because their parents are likely to be rich and successful, which gives you a head start, can give you the time or money to pursue your passions and go to auditions, for example. The second thing a lot of people will probably think of is connections. The network that people build up from having been to those schools. You're being educated alongside the children of highly successful people who will one day become highly successful themselves. If you don't know someone who could help you out in your industry of choice, then you'll probably know someone who knows someone. Or you'll know someone who knows someone who knows someone. The old boys network, they used to call it. It's the reason why, if I'm at a certain kind of party, I'll most likely be asked where I went to school. Has anyone seen the movie The Riot Club? There's a scene where they've all just started at Oxford University, and two of the posh boys ask a couple of girls which school they went to. I just find it really annoying when people ask me what school I went to. Yeah, yeah. I hate it. Oh, I hate, I hate it. That so much. Which school did you go to? And the girls are confused why they'd even be asked this question, because who cares what secondary school you went to? I just went to a normal school in Cardiff. <laughs> oh, I've been to Cardiff. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I love the Welsh. It's a local school. You'll never have heard of it. Why would you ask? Where did you guys go? Eden. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people who ask this question are innocently seeing if we can find any mutual friends or have anything in common. Oh, you went to that school? Well, I know so-and-so who went there. Do you know him? No, but I used to play lacrosse with his sister. Oh, wonderful. How is she? And so on, there you go. Conversation begun, you have mutual acquaintances. That world is remarkably small. Many times I've been surprised at just how small. It really is. If someone's been to one of those schools, it's highly likely we're only a few degrees of separation apart. True also that the odd person will ask that question to find out if you're the right sort of person worth talking to, their sort of person from their world, and that's the reason portrayed in the Riot Club. Though honestly, I think that kind of attitude, while real, happens far less than stereotypes would have you believe. Or maybe I've just been lucky. So those two things, parental support and money, and connections are the two things I think a lot of people think of when they think of the head starts of the privileged. Some people may also think of an outstanding education and your dreams and talents being nurtured and encouraged. Yes, all also true, I think. But what I wanted to talk about are the advantages I think a lot of people don't even realize they have. Things that are a little vaguer and harder to explain. Though in my eyes, I've seen just how powerful these things can be, though they are hard to define or to point to as advantages. Nepotism is not the only advantage of being around success. This is why I call this video the Nepo Baby Delusion, as in out of touch with reality. Because I think Kendall Jenner and Lily Rose Depp and some of the others are totally blind to the more invisible advantages their upbringing has given them. And perhaps this is a little presumptuous of me, but for reasons we went through, I feel somewhat qualified to explain some of those things. This is what I wanted to talk about. The blind spot, the invisible factor of being in proximity to success that Nepo babies don't even notice because it doesn't have a direct result. Something you only notice when it's gone. I remember when I started, age 13, at boarding school for the first time, okay. So this, feel, this feels a little odd in case any, any of my old friends are watching this um, because I've never expressed this was my experience to any of them, but it's fine. No one be weird about it. Don't be weird. This is just how I felt at the time. So, okay, I was so intimidated by everyone. Yes, I was very shy anyway. I've always been, always been very shy. But on top of that, it was a vastly different environment with vastly different kids, most of whom had been to fancy prep schools since they were young. I was astonished at how confident they were compared to other kids I knew. These kids could stride confidently up to any adult, hold out their hand with a polite smile, introduce themselves, and then converse quite naturally and grown up. Like they were equals. Like, like they were involved in some kind of type of business deal. Or just like... <laughs> so this was one of the most striking things. I had never before seen such an unself-conscious group of teenagers who, at least to me, seemed so sure of themselves and their place in the world, who seemed to believe in themselves so powerfully. I remember when I first started, I was so intimidated by this outward appearance, plus the posh accents, plus all the terribly long words many of them used in casual conversation, and the outstanding education they'd had until that point, that for a while I thought I was really behind. 
I thought everyone must be so much cleverer and more capable than me to just be so confident and self-assured. I was like, wow, everyone here is just a hundred times smarter than me. So also, this is worth noting. Um, to be succeeding at school and putting loads of work into it wasn't seen as weird. Most of the popular kids were incredibly dedicated academically, um, and to not be working hard or constantly messing around wasn't the status symbol I've seen it be at other schools. With some exceptions, like sometimes, occasionally, you know, um, but with some exceptions, in general, it wasn't hugely admired or seen as cool to be pissing your education away um, or not caring about your future. There were a few kids like that who perhaps got a little, a little social kudos for not caring. Though from what I remember, there was the general feeling of most people looking down on them a bit, um, even if they found them funny or they're like, oh, they're kind of like, like I don't know. That, that was just my feeling. And generally people were seeing it as a little bit dumb that they didn't care. Um, and I think that type of school culture will have a massive effect on how successful you'll be in life. Um, I've been at schools where that's not the case, and it's seen as weird to really care about exams and schoolwork. That wasn't the case here. In general, working hard was pretty encouraged, even amongst the other students, and people didn't get shit for working really hard and wanting to go to a really good uni. Anyway, okay, so back back to this was how I felt when I, when I started. So scared so out of place, like, like I'd never catch up because everyone must just be so intelligent because they were all so confident and believed in themselves so much and I'd never really met teenagers like that before. And on top of that, a lot of them had these really booming, powerful, posh voices that could be quite intimidating, really sound like they know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> so yes. But after about three weeks of being there, I started to acclimatise and see through the glamour a little bit. I vividly remember ringing my mum and having this conversation about three weeks in, um, where I was I was half disbelieving and I, I said to her in this amazed tone of voice, you know, mum, I, I actually think I'm I'm just as smart as most of them. Which was like a revelation for me. I remember, I remember having that revelation, like, hang on, am I am I am I I think I'm actually just as clever as that they are. Because I started to realise that sometimes they were using those long words out of context, that just because they seemed to hardly ever doubt themselves didn't necessarily mean they were more competent. And once the immediate glamour of the cut glass accents and extraordinarily long sentences faded, I might hear an answer one of them would give in a lesson and realise, wow, what a fucking stupid thing to say. But there is something really admirable there. I learned to really admire that about them, just this breezy self-belief that I watched so often pay off. Which was a revelation to me. I was constantly crippled by intense shyness and very obvious self-doubt. But to be around people who, at least on the surface, seemed so sure of themselves and so sure they deserved to take up space, and why not? Um, and I saw how hugely that benefited them in their lives. They hardly ever seemed embarrassed about trying something or worried that they'd fail. They had this extraordinary self-belief that I'm not sure even to this day many of them realise how rare that is in the general population. At least not, at least maybe not in, um, amongst the British. I don't know. America maybe has a bit... It's very different. I'm not saying it's like American culture was different, but, um, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe in general in America it's slightly different because there's... Yeah, but anyway, anyway, okay. I don't have time, I won't go to that. Yeah, I mean, it's something everyone should learn. I really believe that. If, if if you walk into a room with enough confidence, people assume you must know what you're doing. They assume you know what you're talking about. And true, the fancy Hollywood schools or people or whatever it is that I'm sure, you know, people like Lily Rose Depp or Kendall Jenner attended or knew, people they knew, um, are different to what I experienced, but I would bet a lot of money that there's a very similar attitude and confidence there. I can't stress enough how I actually think that's one of the most important things to get out of being in that sort of environment. More than the education itself. I, I very strongly believe that. There's an air in these schools that everyone's going to be someone. Your teachers think you're going to be someone. Yes, even if you're failing academically. It's kind of like, like, who cares if you're bad at maths? You'll probably be able to hire someone to do it for you. And it's not an air of encouragement. This is the thing. This is, it, it's not necessarily encouragement. It's not like the teachers are saying, I believe in you, you can do it. No, what's happening is far more powerful than that. There is simply the feeling that it is taken for granted that someday you're going to be someone because of course you are. Pretty much everyone here is. They don't have to express belief because it's seen as a fact and you don't have to believe in a fact. You simply act as if it is true. No ambition really was seen as that foolish or out of reach. Um, for a big ambition, there's obviously the feeling of, well, of course you'll have to work really hard. 
But most, in general, most of the time I found it, and certainly in comparison to other schools I was at, it was seen as totally achievable. And I didn't even notice the power of this silent expectation that I was capable and had no reason for not succeeding until I was at state college for the last year of school. And again, this is from someone who's not even really from that world. Um, you don't know what it is that you have until there's a lack of it. You know, that's when you go, oh my God, that was a thing. So I noticed it a little when I was there, but I really noticed it when it was gone. So if that's all someone has experienced, I don't blame them for not noticing it or seeing it as an advantage or even knowing that this, this is a thing. Like it's just, you know. Okay, so now please don't misunderstand. The teachers at college were not bad, but the ambitions were a lot lower. I was noticing really talented, intelligent kids who at my old schools would have been told, you know, go to Oxbridge, become a famous novelist, come back and see me again when you're prime minister, were given less ambitious goals. It was, you know, try for a good uni. You're really smart, you could become a teacher. And please, I'm not shitting on teachers. I think it's, it's a valuable and admirable profession. However, can you see that difference there? And the kids who were not doing well were worried about. The possibility they might, they might end up as failures, unable to feel, feed themselves, um, was a very real one. At my previous schools, the kids who were, no offense, shit academically, weren't really worried about like that because they'll obviously be successful in something non-academic, clearly. So I truly don't think the power of that belief can be underestimated. When people know something is possible and much is expected of them, I think often people rise to the occasion. Of course, in some cases, you then have nepotism and family money on top of that, but even in and of itself, that confidence is powerful. That's actually what it gives you, I think, those places. The knowledge that success is achievable. It just seems that, that it becomes kind of mundane. It's self-confidence and it ingrains in you the belief of, well, why the bloody hell not me? Instead of, you know, I could never do that. That's such a ridiculous dream. Or that seems like it's a bit above myself. God, I don't, I don't want to seem too arrogant. Things like that aren't for me. It's impossible. So, so unlikely. Now, of course, neither of those things are determiners of success. Plenty of people with the self-confidence fail and plenty without encouragement go on to do great things. But by God, does it help? because that was the biggest difference I noticed in kids from private schools versus ones from state schools. It wasn't intelligence, it wasn't talent, it was unashamed self-confidence and not seeing success as something difficult or impossible or embarrassing. And this wasn't a really underprivileged state school. Some kids were, but for the most part, it, it was just like normal kids versus those educated at the top schools in the country. And I really noticed that attitude in other kids when I left, this slightly apologetic, embarrassed, gosh, it could never be me, sort of attitude, although not necessarily with the word gosh in there. Um, <laughs> that sort of attitude in a lot of them. A little like they were worried they'd be too big for their boots if they aimed too high or tried too hard. So many dismissed the possibility. And here's the other thing. The power of no longer being intimidated by successful, famous, or just upper-class people um, is something that those in those circles wouldn't even see as an advantage. But I promise you, it is. To stand next to someone who's fabulously successful or wealthy or posh or even famous and not feel inferior. To not look at those people and think they must be so fundamentally different from you on some level so you could never hope to be one of them. Instead, their position, their position in life looks achievable to you because you've seen enough of it to realise that a lot of it is just an illusion. A very good performance. Stagecraft. Like a tragic starlet. Not even intentional stagecraft. Just years of an upbringing and education that's conditioned you to believe you are deserving. And honestly, why not? We'll come back to that inferiority thing later. I know it, like I said, I felt it. Um, but I think that feeling is poison. If you believe yourself inferior to those people, one, you'll resent them. Um, and two, you'll make them and everyone else around you believe it. And you'll probably make it true and you'll always stay a little below them if you don't believe you're deserving. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Are you tortured by never knowing what happened to the unreleased scripts from my unfinished video series, like parts two and three from my review of Netflix's Winx? Are you kept awake at night, pondering what mysteries the 30 minutes I cut from my Rolo video could hold? 30 key minutes where I addressed his unhinged rant that it's impossible for women to have heroes' journeys or be good protagonists. Did did you enjoy channel videos like I become a narcissist, I declare war on mosquitoes, 
And of course, ha, the classic, I talk and 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 talk. If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then joining my online cult could be the right choice for you. That's right. Over at The Authentic Observer on Patreon, you'll get access to unreleased scripts from videos I never uploaded, the cut sections from longer videos, if there are any, and hours and hours of unedited rambles. I talk about everything, like how important mood is in storytelling and the difference, if any, between masculine and feminine points of view in writing, or a video discussing the poetry of some of my patrons. All that time Fresh and Fit had a proud grapist on their podcast. Remember Scientology? <laughs> Old news! The Authentic Observer is the hip new cult on the block. All the cool kids are signing up. You do want to be cool, don't you? There are so many options to choose from. Our entry-level tier, Skirts and Stockings, is a great choice for beginners. Overgrown Harry Potter kids may feel more at home as a devoted follower of Asus. And for the alpha males amongst you, the woodshed could be just what you need. Just don't let Rolo see you. No one knows what he does to the men he catches. The Authentic Observer cult operates on an honesty system. All tiers have the same access to content, the idea being to support the channel and the content produced here at whatever level you feel appropriate. At the moment, I don't take sponsorships, so if you value the content on this channel and would like to support me, that's where to do it. Link down below in the description box. So if, like myself, you enjoy listening to the sound of my voice, hop on over to Patreon for an offer you don't want to miss. Join a cult today! So, another day, another, another outfit, because who repeats outfits, am I right? Um, I, I ran out of time filming yesterday, so I decided today, rather than, rather than getting dressed up, in what I was wearing yesterday, I'm, I'm, look, can you guess who? Guess who? Guess who? Hi, it's me, Kendall, um, Kendall Jenner. This is Kendall back in her living paycheck to paycheck era. <laughs> Nepo baby at leisure outfit that I'm wearing, you know, off-duty model, um, that's kind of the vibes I'm going for. It's like a latte, smoothie, green juice type thing, like all in one. Ran all over not only New York City, but all over Europe trying to, you know, get a job. I couldn't even like afford to get like a cab. Um, I was literally, like literally running, literally running. I never took that for granted. I always knew that that was there, but that almost made my job a little bit harder. There's this perception people have that it's been easy for me. And actually, what's really damaging to a modeling career is already being famous and having a really, like, hot sister who's known as a sex symbol um, and being, you know, on TV and having a massive social media presence. And that was, like, all really hard for me when I first started um, modeling. Um, only because people, you know probably didn't want to hire me because I was on a reality TV show. It was hard. I, I'll be honest, it was hard. Um, but, you know, here I am now. Self-made. I could really annoy you all and continue doing the rest of this video in my terrible American accent. Um, but how about I don't? Let's keep it classy. <laughs> Kidding, America. Kidding, that was a joke. So. See, I can see why they do this, why they sort of wander around with their phones and like their bags and their lattes or whatever they have, I don't know, and the sunglasses, like you just feel quite, I don't, why do you, why do you, why do I feel important now that I've got like a stupid drink that's not even a real drink? I just put a brooch in here to make it sound like I had ice cubes, <laughs> but why does this feel important with the phone? I feel like my manager's going to call me any minute. I've, I've got an agent. It's, oh, it's Kim. You, just, you know why I think she like rushing around from like Kendall obviously was doing you know running around from auditions and just like grab that actually this is probably all they eat isn't it so it wouldn't sit right with me doing a video on the delusion of a lot of nepo babies if I didn't also talk about something else that bothers me just as much 
Given what I've spoken about in this video so far, it may surprise you to know that something I dislike just as much as Nepo Baby delusion is the indiscriminate despising of Nepo Babies or I guess privilege, for no reason. Jamie Lee Curtis and others have tried to express this idea, um, though admittedly in the worst way possible. And also, I don't know, they're probably not the people to be saying it anyway, or at least certainly not in the way they did. Um, I think <laughs> coming from the positions, like it was like Lottie Moss was another one with like a terrible take um, and got like dogpiled on Twitter for just saying something so like out of touch and tactless. Um, I think if you are gonna be in that position and say something, you then you have to do it well and they did neither and then it's even worse because of who they are and it's just yeah so yeah so they kind of tried to express this idea though admittedly in the worst way possible nepotism is not necessarily bad okay um and also most people aren't above it probably especially the people complaining the most about it if you have fame and resources it's your prerogative to share it with your children I think pretty much anyone would, that's why I guess we see so much nepotism. Um, a big reason a lot of people build resources in the first place is for the sake of their children. Nepotism actually comes from a really positive human instinct of loyalty and looking out for those close to you. And honestly, I think really everyone does it, just with most people, they're not playing in the big leagues. Anyone know someone who's gotten a job as a waitress because, I don't know, a friend or a family member works there and recommended you? Like, you know, stuff like that happens quite frequently, I think. Or, you know, if you've known someone who's tried to get someone else they know a job, you know, or people end up working, I don't know, I know I've known people who like ended up working in like that uncle's construction business or something, which it's not the same as, you know, been at the top levels or, you know, been top actor or in the music industry or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it's still, it's still like, still form of nepotism, just, you know, obviously not, not playing with, um, millions and millions of of monies um, and loads of fame and stuff on top of that. And also I think there's somewhat the perception in a lot of those other industries that aren't fame that you have to, I think the reason why, the, okay, this I haven't scripted this, but then there are a few reasons why fame gets more scrutiny than others. Obviously it's because first of all, famous, um, obviously it's gonna get more scrutiny and criticism. And um, the second thing though, I think even though nepotism does happen like pretty much everywhere. I think, and this isn't, this is by no means a blanket rule or anything, but I think in a lot of cases, like for example, if you are gonna, let, let's say the example I used, gonna go work for your uncle's construction business, you really have to develop some skills and knowledge and be able to do that. I mean, maybe not, there probably, there probably, there will be people working for people that are totally useless, but I think in general, the expectation more is that, you know, you, you've got skills, you've got some abilities, you've got something there because you have to kind of earn your keep. Whereas I think the perception with celebrity is that, listen, look at me, listen to the language I'm using, the perception, um, I'm becoming one of them. The perception, oh God, um, with celebrity is that, and sometimes it's true that you actually don't have to develop a skill. You can just, I mean, some of them aren't talented and aren't skilled and they're becoming successful anyway. And I think people see that and are like, wow. Um, so there's that level, I suppose, that if it, it's, you could be really untalented and bad at what you do and still be famous or successful, even if it's just via like social media by being a Nepo baby. Um, but one thing I'll say in their favor, at least they're, and, and that's by no means all of them. There are loads of really talented, hardworking Nepo babies. That's the other thing. It's not, it's not a blanket rule or anything. Um, and the other thing is at least they're doing something. Like at least they're not, you know, sitting around spending their parents' money. At least they're going out and working and trying to build on what their parents' legacy or craft, build that craft and those skills. And it kind of makes sense that they go into the same industries their parents are at. Maybe they've got the same kind of talents or skills, or maybe it's just, um, you know, it just makes sense. Um, or that they want to, I don't know, make their parents proud or do what they're doing. Anyway, irrelevant, but you get what I'm saying. Okay. So yeah, like, well, like I was saying, nepotism, everyone does it even on like a small scale of like, oh, hey, you need a job. Um, the restaurant I work at, we're looking for people. I can recommend you to the manager. I'll come in like, I, and come, you, you see what I mean? Okay, so it's normal. Is it also possible to be born immensely advantaged and still be a decent grounded person who is grateful for what they have and isn't so out of touch they may as well live on Mars? Yes, it's possible. I know some of those people. In Jamie Lee Curtis's defense, Though her response was one of the most embarrassingly LA things I've ever read, um, she's right when she says, like, some people are been snide and unfair. She's right, some people are. And I have seen some people, and it isn't the majority, I don't think, or I hope not, but I don't think it is. Um, it's like Twitter weirdos. 
But that there, there are some people who just hate Nepo babies indiscriminately because of their background. And honestly, I, I just really hate that attitude. Um, and it's an attitude that extends beyond Nepo babies. I think it's just, it's just bitter. It, that, that, there's no other word, and people might get mad at me describing the attitude like that. But in, it, and look, I'm not, in the way that I'm talking about when it's expressed, okay? I'm not saying that any criticism of people all getting like annoyed at someone who's really privileged and is saying something dumb. This is not what we're talking about. I hope most people get that it's that particular just like hatred and dislike of that in that way. Like bitter is really the only word for it. I think it's just bitter and nasty and comes off as angry. Angry that they have something you want. Someone's family isn't their fault. Get over it. <laughs> I'm turning into Lottie Moss now. Get over it. Um, but there's a point there, not in the way she said it and the way, like, that's, and I'm not saying that no one can talk about nep babies, that's not the context in which I'm using it because those people are equally stupid. Um, but just bashing nepo babies is pointless. I'm not talking, as I say, I'm not talking about criticism for things they actually do or say, but hating them just because their families are wealthy or famous. It's pathetic. And, and this is what I mean by that, I don't mean that as an insult, I mean that really literally. I think you make yourself pathetic to be in that state by having that attitude. I don't mean like as an insult that's pathetic, I mean kind of is in a way, but more than anything else, you make, you put yourself in a pathetic state when you do that. And I'll explain, this is what I mean by that. Okay, so do you know who I think is hurt the most by the attitude of hating anyone successful for no other reason than that they're successful or lucky? It doesn't hurt successful people, I can tell you that. It only hurts the people who feel that way and pretty much guarantees those people will never become successful themselves because they resent it on a, and on some level probably think they don't deserve it even as they covet it. Um, I think a lot of it comes from believing you're inferior to the successful people, but at the same time you resent them for it and it's all a mess. Like you, you it's like, an inf in, it's an inferiority and superiority complex like at the same time. You believe you're inherently better because you're not filthy rich or immensely privileged or lucky or whatever it is. Um, but at the same time, you feel lesser. I, th I think, I think to some extent this is true. Um, I don't mean you as in you literally, I'm talking about the people with that kind of bitter, just like full on angry attitude. You're accepting the fact you're pathetic. It's a bad place to be in for your own sake. And this is what I was talking about earlier, the inferiority thing. And here, look, people probably aren't gonna like to hear this, but I think this is just very true. It is its own form of snobbery. It, 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 it just is. Like, you're not any less of a snob just because the target of who you're looking down on is different. Because that's what it is in essence, is looking down. It's not okay if someone instantly judges and dismisses you if you grew up on a council estate. And it's also not okay to do the same to someone who grew up on a different kind of estate. <laughs> and I'm not saying no one can ever look down on people. There's valid reasons for doing that, but it's when you do it, well, I guess the only word for it is prejudice. It's when you do it based on nothing they've shown you about who they are, when you're assuming things, when you assume a load of things about who they must be, their upbringing, what they must believe, what kind of people they must be, um, how they became successful, what like what they think, when you're assuming all of that and looking down on them for the idea, this magical idea you've constructed in your minds. Yeah, it's, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, okay, I don't, like, and there's, like, but if, if it's, if that's justified, that's fine, but a lot of the time it's not, you're just making things up. And one of, the, I think one of the reasons why I'm coming at it from this angle is because, like, I've, I, again, I've had people do that to me based purely either on my accent. Um, yeah, well, like, I mean, that's pretty much what Vorsch did, which was funny because then it's like, maybe you shouldn't just assume a shit ton of stuff about someone, especially when he's coming from the position he is. But I've had that not just from Vorsch. I've actually, I've had that, I've had that in particular one instance from a teacher that I've told this, I, maybe I haven't told the story. I've, I've mentioned this briefly before in the case. I had this with a teacher who like kind of just hated me and made my life really difficult because she didn't like me and she ended up admitting that it was basically because of my accent and she just assumed like a whole host of stuff about me um, and who she thought I was and then disliked that idea and just made my life really difficult. Um, and was just, just, just like mean to me. I was 17 as well. And especially when you're making all these assumptions that are false, but you think it's, it's acceptable um, because you've, you've put someone in this camp where you're like, you're like, oh, they're, you know, more privileged than me, whether that's true or not. And sometimes it's not. Um, and then you, and then you, you can be an asshole to them or just assume they're a bad person or, and that does happen. I see that quite a lot. And it's just like, it just, I don't know. It's just annoying. I don't think it's justified. And it is, I think it's, it, I think it is its own form of snobbery. When I was a kid, I used to kind of feel insecure about that if, and just assume people were going to go in and 
make all these assumptions. But now, now I don't. I mean, I don't care now. I just get annoyed by it. If I, I, I if yeah, I, I just think, well, you're kind of a bit of a fucking loser if if you're just making all these um if you're just making all these assumptions about people. And again, you know what? Actually, I think it goes back to like groupthink. People have this thing like, well, this group. Yeah, it is. It's it's it's. It's another weird form of identity politics. Um, probably that's more prevalent in the UK, but it's like, oh, if I put this, if if I just assume all these things about these people and just put them in this group, this group is has way more advantages and privileges than me, and you know, it's all this again. However, it's very different on like an interpet when you're dealing with people, people to people. You you can't, you're not justified in just being an asshole because you've assumed that they must be part of this group and therefore all these things must be true, whether they're true or not. I mean, whether certain things are true on a, like a big scale and the macro scale when it comes to like interpersonal dynamics, I just think it's kind of it's not the same, and it's just and then sometimes you just end up just being a dickhead to just a person for no reason. Um, anyway, that's a, maybe a conversation for another time. But but here's the thing. Look, my point here though is about that it's not it, it's it's. It's still affecting you the most, I think, that attitude. I think it, I think the only person it really hurts is yourself. Um, and I don't mean that in some hippie way of like, oh, like, I mean, I think, I think in the long term, really, it, it only really affects you. So I've got an example of this attitude being more self-sabotaging than anything else. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying that you can't criticise... Um, certain things in society. I'm not saying you can't criticize the class structure. I'm not saying you can't criticize. I'm not saying you can't have problems with the fact that like so many politicians have all been to the same schools and the same type of schools and what like these are all valid things. I'm not saying that then you can't criticize that. But, but like there's a. I'm not in saying that. I'm not saying that you can't criticize those things. But people just take that and like now I can be a dickhead to this person for no reason other than. I think they must have had an easier life than me and I'm mad about that. And I do see the attitude. Um, and I think it's just, it's just a bit childish. So, okay. But I've got an, I've got an example of this attitude being more self-sabotaging than anything else. And it's this is in a different context, but I trust you're all intelligent enough to understand the parallels. Okay, so I've got a close friend. This, this bag is really annoying. <laughs> Put it on my knee. Here we go. It's got all my Nepo baby money in it. I wish, oh, okay. Um, so I've got a close friend who is a truly lovely person. I've known them for years. Um, I'm, keeping the, I'm keeping this gender neutral to be as vague as possible. But this friend is honestly a joy and a delight to be around, endlessly generous and lovely, always been there for me. My life is better because they're in it. This friend is also from, I think it's more than fair to say, the, the upper echelons of society. Let, let's put it like that. Anyway, so my friend started dating someone who was from the total opposite end of society. Someone who grew up poor from a very rough area. Now, my friend adored this person, and I knew this because my friend told me all of the many wonderful things about them. Never did my friend think it was a big deal. The person they liked was from a different, was from a totally different world. It featured so far down the list of things they thought were important about this person. And again, I know that because of all the things my friend said about this person and would talk about this person and that it just wasn't really a thing. But the other person did. They cared a lot. Um, they thought it was the biggest deal. This person felt so self-conscious about the background that my friend did not, honestly did not care about. Look, and I'm not saying that's a problem feeling like initially self con like fe having self-consciousness a bit. I'm not like trying to make this person seem like a villain for that. It's for them the it's for then not being able to let that go and the behaviour that I'm going to explain that follows. But I don't think there's anything bad or wrong or um, about about that person. It makes sense to me, basically, why that person would feel more self-conscious about it than my friend would. But I still, I don't think that still, I still don't think that justifies what I'm going to explain about, explain next. If that makes sense. Yeah, so this person felt so self-conscious about the background that my friend honestly did not care about. This person felt so inferior to my friend which, as I say, honestly, if you'd heard how much my friend was singing this person's praises, it's absurd they would think my friend would ever see them in a lesser light. Um, but anyway, that's how that's how they felt. So what started out initially as harmless jokes from, from their end um, got quite nasty. Things like light-hearted banter about my friend's accent became like a really cruel public mockery, trying to humiliate 
my friend in front of other people for groups of people, you know, just, you know, when something goes from, like, ba banter, and then it's like, oh, there's this is vicious, and just trying to pub, trying to tear someone down in front of other people, and just, yeah. And just basically constant snide comments from this person that they thought were justified and deserved um, towards my friend. Um, they, they never let my friend forget where they came from. Constantly, and I mean constantly, making them feel bad for things they couldn't help and had never asked for, and making it a massive problem in their relationship. And because my friend is a lovely person, they put up with it for a very long time and were unsure if it was even something they were allowed to complain about or feel hurt about. Which they didn't, my friend felt quite hurt about this. So my, my friend my friend tentatively asked me if, if they were allowed to feel upset about it because, you know, of course I've been privileged. And I said, bullshit. If, if your significant other is constantly making you feel terrible and worthless with no provocation and even making you believe you deserve it because of the random luck of birth, punishing you, in other words, um, I don't care what their justification is, they belong in the bin. I feel really, I feel like a little old lady holding this bag like this. God, I went from fashion icon Nepo baby to, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, but so, so my friend then ended up telling that person, I can't help my background. I can't change any of these things about myself. I understand how you feel about it, but I really don't deserve your constant anger and disdain. It wasn't me who's responsible for the suffering in your life. So at some point, if we're going to have a healthy and functioning relationship, you're just gonna have to let it go and get over it. And the other person admitted they couldn't get over it, that they couldn't forgive my friend for having been born with something they were not. And so that was it, relationship over. It reminds me a little bit of the dynamic between Matt Damon and Minnie Driver in Goodwill Hunting, in the sense that he blamed her, really, for how he felt about himself and pushed her away because he didn't think he deserved her, or believed that she could ever really truly care about someone like him, even though she clearly adored him because he had a bit of an inferiority thing going on and was like, well, she's like, you know, up here and he, yeah. Um, and then that manifested itself, seeing her as like so much, so far above him and out of his league, then manifested as like kind of bitterness towards her basically and punishing her for that. I mean, you just want to have your little fling with like the guy from the other side of town. Then you're going to go off to Stanford. You're going to marry some rich prick who your parents will approve of and just sit around with the other trust fund babies and talk about how you went slumming too once. Why are you saying this? What is your obsession with this money? But you know, the thing is, like, I've seen that, I've, I've seen things like that happen more than once with friendships as well as relationships. Not just in terms of um, money or status, but other things people are resentful of too. Um, like jealousy. Jealousy or like bitterness or, you know, it can eat through all sorts of deep bonds. Um, and my point, look, my point is this. This is, this is why I'm telling the story. My point is this. My friend never saw this person as inferior. They adored this person. And honestly, I got sick of hearing how amazing and intelligent and talented and sweet this person was. Um, but this person could never shake their own inferiority complex and allowed it to become such a monster. They sabotaged a great relationship with someone who thought they were wonderful, all because they felt bad about themselves and blamed, or like life had been unfair to them, um, and then blamed my friend for it projecting it onto them rather than just accepting that yes though life is not fair and that sucks but life is not fair sometimes you do just have to let it go not be so angry at everyone who unintentionally represents that unfairness and in doing that probably improve your life in the process and again i'm not saying that means you have to not allow to criticize any unfairness or injustices or you you're not allowed to criticize the class system or point out how certain things are fair. You, I'm not saying that. I hope you're not, I'm not been like, everyone protect the elites. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying that, but I hope you get what the point I'm trying to make is that you can still do that and not be bitter and angry and hate everyone who, through no fault of their own, just like, you know, your background was no fault of your own, has had things you didn't. That's not their fault. That's not their like problem. That's um, and you can, you could do those things without blaming them for it or blame, like having a personal, because I think a lot of this does feel very personal where it's like, you person now, look, you're to blame for the fact that you have all that and I don't. It's like, and I, it's just, um, it, that kind of thing only hurts you, I think. But yeah, so, so anyway, that was a story about a per how, how that attitude ruined something in an aspect of your personal life, 
But um, I think I think that would have a similar effect on your professional life. If you wanted to be successful, yet resented the successful, how's that gonna work? Either you have to become what you hate, or I don't know, you're just like an internal conflict, or I just don't think it's probably gonna work out that well. Yeah, I, I just, I truly think that kind of attitude is a corrosive acid, but only to yourself. It's like, it just, true. I'm gonna be all profound here, but it reminds me of that, <laughs> reminds me of that Buddha quote. Yeah, and you, you guys knew you subscribed to me for some reason. It's for, oh, look at me, I'm so spiritual with my quotes and stuff. That Buddha quote is, holding onto anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. That's what, I, I think that just perfectly explains the attitude. Holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. You're just kind of like corroding yourself. Like even, she's just, I don't want to go off another tangent again, but even my teacher, who just gave me a really bloody hard time for no reason when I was 17, um, and admitted, she ended up admitting that that was why. I'm not just like making this up that she disliked me for another reason. That No, she ended up admitting that was the reason, was basically because of my accent and she just assumed all these things about me. Um, but it, it actually only really... Like, yeah, it wasn't good for me, for my self-esteem at 17 to be having that and a teacher just constantly giving me crap all the time. But um, as an adult woman, very professional of you. But it, I, it really only met, it really only hurt her in the end. And I think she was actually really quite an unhappy, bitter person. And I think I, I feel like I'm probably a lot happier in a better place than she definitely was then. Maybe even if, how she is now, if she's not, you know, sorted out. But that was just, she was just like a bitter, she was just like... An, awful to be around, um, and just resentful and angry and wanted to be, again, like, yeah, was actually trying to be successful and wasn't really going anywhere with it. And I'm not surprised if she was kind of like that. But here, and here's the other thing though as well, like, yes, it hurts you. It's not a good attitude. But also, as I kind of said earlier, you're not justified in being an asshole to someone because you think they had something you didn't. I, and I see that smug, self-satisfied attitude a lot. Vosh. <coughs> Even though he did have a lot, but whatever. But but that attitude of people actually thinking being horrible is a moral thing to do if you've decided the target of that has something that makes them privileged in some way, whether they can control it or not. That's another reason why I've titled my video male feminists hate women. Um, and I don't, that, I may, I, I've said in the part, I don't mean like all everyone, I'm talking like really extreme political people online. So many of them, they have the, I truly think they do, do not like women, but it's, they've decided, and Hassan said something similar where he said something about, oh, it was, it was like really awful comment about like rich women, but basically like that they, yeah, and, and something about salt as well. And it was just like, wow. Billionaire wasp fail sons. Um, at least taking them out of other colleges so they can only do date rape to other billionaire millionaire failed daughters is like in some respects you know from a utilitarian perspective of course a little bit better you know don't you just love leftist male feminists i mean i think we can all agree from a utilitarian perspective that women that just happen to be white and have wealthy parents they deserve less respect i mean i'm pro-woman i mean unless she disagrees with my politics or I don't like her, then she can get fucked. I'm just gonna try to really quickly say this because this is not what this video is about. I tried to find the full context of this of this sound clip, I can't find it. However, the obvious, you know, the obvious response is, oh, it's lighthearted, he's joking, which, you know, I think I think is a fair counterpoint that it, it, if he's joking, it's not going to be taken seriously. I'm, I'm leaving this clip in because I think this is really, and you see this attitude all the time. Um, not just, not just in joke form. I think it happens. It happens a lot in, in those kind of circles. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go into this. This video is not about this, so I'm not going to go massively into it here. But yeah, I'm just going to throw up some comments that was underneath that TikTok. Um, to kind of emphasize what I'm talking about. Where yeah, that this exact attitude that I'm talking about, and not just in resp in in terms of the whole women and feminist argument, but also in terms of the whole just hate like wanting terrible things to happen to um rich people. And also because I I scripted and edited. I scripted and filmed this video way before the whole submarine thing happened. But you know, there was a massive thing from that where people were just like, yeah, they deserved to die because they were rich. This is you under like the genuinely ill wishing, wishing terrible, horrible things to happen to people because of whatever group you think they're in. Um even to the point where supposedly quote unquote feminists will be like, oh how wouldn't it be funny if they were assaulted because they deserve it. Cause yeah. They don't I don't think they care about 
being progressive or women's issues. I think they just like having a group a group of women that they can take all their anger out on and put them in a little group and they're like well these women are privileged women so we can just be as misogynistic to them as we want and awful but it's fine and then also claim we're feminists it's like wow you really thought you could work that one did you yeah anyway anyway but but that's my point you're not but in no cases even but like i don't think you're not justified in being an asshole to someone because you think they had something you didn't and that, that smug, which again I said, I, I see that smug, self-satisfied attitude a lot of people actually thinking being horrible is a moral thing to do if you've decided they have something that makes them privileged in some way, whether they can control it or not. It, it, and here's a really <laughs> important thing. It doesn't make you noble blaming an individual for your hurts or injustices they had nothing to do with. They were dealt a better hand, sure, but it's not their fault and they don't deserve to be hated for it. And what that would be um, irritating enough um, doing that anyway, but what I really dislike is on top of that, people have that anger and that attitude and then go, but I'm, I'm a good person, I'm justified in doing this because I've decided that they're in this group, which means that I'm allowed to be awful. And it's actually, not only is it not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing because it makes me noble. And I'm defending um, the underprivileged. And it's like that old thing, what's that old quote? Um, that socialists, and I'm not saying this about all socialists, but there's, there's this, socialists don't care about poor people, they just hate rich people. And I'm not, I'm not saying that about everyone, I'm saying there's, there's an attitude yeah, that's attitude. It's like it's like you don't I, like. That's why I don't buy it. It's like it's less that I think, and this attitude that I'm talking about. It's I don't buy that you actually care in a lot of cases that these people care about making things fair, or when they have this particular attitude that I'm talking about, um, or about helping everyone get to that level, or whatever it happens to be. In a lot of cases, it's just it is just hating people who again who through no fault of their own are privileged in whatever way you've decided, it's hating them rather than trying to help people who don't have that. That's the vibe I get from a lot of it. That's kind of the point. But also, what I'm saying is that doesn't mean, I'm not saying you can't crack jokes about privilege and Nepo babies. You know, even the reasonable Nepo babies. I'm not saying you can't joke about them or like I'm doing that with, look at me, I'm such a, I'm so rich. Yeah, I'm not saying don't make jokes. Like, there's a difference between light-hearted mockery versus bitterness. I hope that's clear in my general philosophy and my stance. I'm not saying don't joke. Joke about pretty much anything. Um, any grounded Nepo baby should be able to take the banter on the chin. And if they can't, they're weak and need to be weeded out anyway. Like Jamie Lee Curtis not being able to handle people pointing out that her parents are Hollywood royalty. That's just a fact. Why have a weird Martin Luther King moment about it? You just made it worse, Jamie. Basically, in this defense of Nepo babies I'm giving, everything I said about Nepo babies is still true. And the roasting of them was still absolutely bloody true. And it's still true that they have so many advantages. Um, and it's also true that they deserve to be mocked when they act like they've not been privileged. But at the same time, if you're hating people for things they can't control and for no other reason, you do actually just need to get over it. As Lottie Moss said in the worst way possible, and she did deserve some of that backlash because that was dumb. Um, but I get what she was trying to get at, but no, Lottie, not in the way that you said it. And also she still was really out of touch. And, and being Kate Moss, being Kate Moss's younger sister and saying that as well in the way that she, it was just bad, bad, PR move. I don't know why she thought that was a good idea. The thing is, you not succeeding at something is not the fault of someone who is succeeding, or you not having something is not the fault of someone who has that thing, unless they've actively like gone and taken it from you or whatever, um, or like screwed you over or whatever to get that. Um, or like engage, or like, okay, this is, yeah, okay, I'm gonna hear the comments now. With the exceptions of like really bloody dodgy business practices and screwing people over, um, and intentionally like, yeah, and probably politicians, and okay. In general, just people who have generally been successful or gathered fame, whatever it happens to be, without, let's assume they've not screwed anyone over, and particularly their children who haven't done anything. That's what I'm talking about. So you not succeeding at something is not the fault of someone who is succeeding, or you not having something is not the fault of someone who has that thing, and hating them for it will only make you bitter and hurt you. I really do believe that. Um, I'm going to draw this comparison for people who might find it easier seeing things this way. 
in my mind, I think it's similar to the more extreme side of the red pill guys. Some of them might get mad at me for saying that. Whether you want, like, it's, okay, I'm sorry, you guys are such a broad group now. Because some people, like, it's like, red pill's not that, but then it's it's like with feminists. Like, feminism's not that. It's like, okay, there's just so many different schools of it. If you're not in this group of people, that's fine. I'm not talking about you. But maybe I'll call them black pill rather than red pill. I don't know, whatever. But you know what I'm talking about when I say this? That side of the internet, the very extreme, but the more extreme side of that side. <sighs> Disclaimer. <laughs> it's similar to the more extreme side of the red pill slash black pill guys who hate all the chads and blame them for why there are no women left for them. Don't say that attitude doesn't exist, I've seen it, it does. Might not be m my majority, but we're using this example, it's true, I've seen it. Who hate all the chads, whatever, and blame them for why there are no women left for them. They hate the chad, they hate the chads and the women. It'll be harder with women if you're not an alpha chad, maybe, or probably, but look, I really don't buy a whole lot of the women don't like me because I'm not rich and handsome. And that's going to be really controversial and probably piss a lot of people off. But I don't buy a whole lot of it. I think it's uh, perhaps in some cases, depending on who you're talking to and hanging out with. And But the, the extremes you take it to and the way, like, you're just, you're just, I just don't think you're right. I know a whole lot of guys who aren't tall, aren't good looking, aren't rich. But rather than thinking they were defeated before they even begun, they have worked so much on their personality, their social skills, confidence and communication that they are really successful with women. I think it's a rare guy who is so screwed that he can't do any level of personality work or self-improvement um, if he... to be able to get to a point where women are interested. And yeah, sure, maybe there's nothing you can do that you can get the supermodels, but... Um, I think that's a rare guy, depending on where you are, where you are. Um, maybe you're just then around like terrible people, but I've just seen guys who have none of those things, but because they've developed their personalities and are great to be around and have a joy to be around and like, then people want to be around them and women want to be around them and then women want to be with them. Anyway, but like I'm saying, sure, it, it will, it will be harder for them, it might be harder for them and they had to put much, much more work in just like it's harder for an average person over a Nepo baby, but it's not impossible. Um, and blaming the successful for your lack of success can serve as an excuse to take all responsibility off yourself. It's self-defeating. You get to hate them rather than yourself. I see, and I do see a lot of that actually um, in some sides of the more extreme red pill thing where it's just like women hating and it's the self-defeating thing of women are all terrible anyway and they're just gonna leave and they're gonna screw you over and like that narrative it's it's the it's an unconfident self-defeating like i'm screwed before i even begin so why even try and then you don't have to be a failure because you've told yourself that it's impossible and i think that's what it is and um, people are gonna get really mad at me for saying that but um i think a lot of cases with a lot of guys that the attitude that i see where it's just like women hating for that reason it's just so that it's just a cope. So you don't have to fail because you've told yourself that it's, it's, there's no point and it's a failure from the beginning. Um, and that women are just fundamentally evil. So, or, or flawed. So that's why they don't like you rather than not liking you for maybe who you are or yeah, there we go. People are going to hate that, but I think that's true. But anyway, yeah, that self-defeating attitude of getting to hate, blaming the successful for your lack of success, getting to hate that, hate them rather than yourself or feel bad about yourself. But in a way, there's something in this attitude I think that's just as entitled as the people you're criticizing. They haven't taken anything away from you. Whether that goes for um, women or success. They haven't taken anything away from you. Why would you think what they have should be yours? It's not fair, but nothing is in life and it never will be. Some people are born really clever and that's not fair. Some people are born really strong and that's not fair. Some people are born really good looking, and that's not fair. Some people are born really rich, and then they can pay a plastic surgeon to make them really good looking, and that's really not fair. <laughs> also, if you want to be successful, you're probably going to have to communicate with other successful people at some point, and they're not dumb, at least not all of them. Um, they'll feel the resentment and be immediately put off because who wants to be around someone who's low-key bitter towards them all the time? That goes for hating women and then wondering why women won't date you. Uh <laughs> also goes for that. Or even worse, maybe they'll sense the inferiority complex and believe the signals you're sending out, that you are insecure, incapable, and not good enough. That, in my opinion, is the most important and most invisible gift of privilege. I think most people can sense that air of self-belief, but they can't quite put their finger on that elusive quality that makes someone seem a little out of your reach. If you have it, you don't realise you have it. 
If you don't have it, you might look at those people and believe on some level they're better or more deserving than you because they have this quality you can't quite describe, but you know it's there. Self-confidence is not quite the word for this, but that's the best way I can get to describing it. Um, this is, I'm just, I just, this is not scripted, I'm just thinking, like, it's not quite right that it's self-confidence because there are people who are immensely confident and it's not, there's an, it's like a, there are people who are self-confident but it's not exactly right to say it like that. They're self-confident but with, like, an insecurity underlying it. It's, of this attitude, it's almost like a confidence with a feeling of security. I don't know how to describe it. I don't think there's a word for it in the English language. Um, this, like, attitude, this... And it's not just being, like, ballsy and just being, like, I'm so... Co like, it's not... An ease. Because there are... I think, I think it's, like... Perhaps you could... Like, the ease of privilege. If you've had, like, perhaps an easier upbringing or... Not necessarily, because sometimes you can have, like, really bad troubles that... Come about and that, you know, just aren't financial. But that... Yes, it's, it's just to clarify it's not just being confident that's not entirely correct it's like an ease of like I don't know a security and an ease and I, I don't know I have to think more about how to define that but that's the closest I can get but yeah if, if you don't have it you might look at those people and believe on some level they're better or more deserving than you because they have this quality you can't quite describe but you know it's there and sometimes it might make you angry and resentful at them for not being able to understand or master what that thing is um, all you know is they feel entitled to certain things in a way that you do not. And sometimes it might make you put them on a pedestal above you and believe they must just be better. Like people do a lot of the time, I think, with Hollywood stars, and like, oh, they're just like another species. They're like gods and goddesses. And they're not. Yeah, I don't think either of those things are particularly healthy. But look, if this sounds depressing and hopeless, that's the last thing I want you to take from this video. The intention is not for anyone to feel like there's no hope for success if your parents aren't already successful. That's so far from true. It also doesn't make sense. Most Nepo babies' parents did it themselves. People people come up from the bottom all the time. Um, admittedly, probably not as many as that are at the top and stay at the top and their families stay at the top. Yeah, that's the thing too. I'm not denying that. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, it happens. You It's perfectly... It, it's, it's possible it's achievable, particularly if you're incredibly talented or skilled or hardworking or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, of course it's hard, especially nowadays with the internet. Um, but of course it's harder coming up from, like, from the bottom. But having successful parents isn't guaranteed success either. It's one factor, a big factor, yes, but one factor. Um, but I, I kind of want you to take something hopeful from this. One huge thing I've noticed in the difference, and this is true, I see, I feel some of this, I don't know how much of this is like, going to piss people off and going to get me into trouble, but this is just true from what I've observed. One huge thing that I've noticed between the privileged and the not, having been in both the, all the environments that I've been in, I think, I think I'm in a position where I can say this, at least just one thing I've noticed, maybe it's not accurate, but is a self-defeating attitude. And I'm not blaming them, I'll go into this, I'm not blaming people for having that self-defeating attitude, I'm just saying this is one of the biggest differences that I've noticed, that it's really clear. But I think if you don't think you can do it before you've even begun, then you're hurting yourself, then you're not gonna try, then, um, yeah. And I, look, I don't mean that to sound as, you know, just believe it and you can do it, it's easy. I, I'm not saying that, and also, I don't think that attitude is easy. I think this is where a lot of people go wrong, they're like, self-belief is really important. Um, and I think people get pissed off at that because they're like, well, that's just a dumb thing to say. If I just believe it, it'll happen. And obviously that's not true for a whole host of reasons. I think it's a factor. I think it's a massive factor believing in yourself. Like it, that sounds like some high school musical bullshit, but I think that is huge in achieving what you want to achieve. But the thing that people miss out on when they say, believe in yourself and you can, you'll find, you know, it's easier to get there. That's true. But the actual believing in yourself part, what people don't stress is that is really difficult. It, I, like, I'm not, I'm not, like, they, they just gloss over that and make it sound easy, just believe it, like, that factor in itself is hard, um, I don't, like, it's not, believe in yourself and, and it's easy, you can do it, I don't think that attitude is easy, that very attitude in itself is a skill, um, and it's a skill that most children of success don't even realise they have, and that they've been working at for years, by the way, it's, like, ingrained into, like, really, um, so I'm not saying that it's, it's an easy thing, it's, like, it's a, it's practice. So it's it, like they don't even realize they're practicing it. And but it's it's it's, it's a, I think it's a skill. Yeah, a skill most children of success don't even realize they have. 
It's like their parents dealt with the mental barriers so they didn't have to. And that doesn't mean they'll have an easy ride, they'll have other stuff to deal with and other, pro like, I hope people, you know, get what I'm saying, but yeah. Um, but here's my point, I'm not blaming people for not having this. I'm not trying to say, you know, just believe and everything will be okay. And I'm not saying that that's the only reason that Kendall Jenner is successful and you're not. That would be ridiculous. I I'm not saying just meditate your way out of poverty or pulling a just pearly things. You know, women who are exhausted after a full shift and expect their husbands to assist them in housework and childcare are just entitled modern women breaking up families over silly things like your husband not pulling his weight and an unfair delegation of responsibilities. But these women just don't understand that being tired is a choice. Yes, she really did say that, and for some context, her daddy's a millionaire. Like, it's a bad look, isn't it? Oh, dude, you have to go home, then you have to cook. Yeah, you have to cook. Then you have to clean. Then you have to put the, the kids to bed. Then you have to do But do you hear how spoiled we are? Do, do you hear how spoiled this sounds? Like, people used to get divorced for real reasons, like the death of a child. You know, my husband's mistress. And now, it, it's because you're frustrated over a messy house. But after a couple of weeks, it, it's really fast for you to be drained. You figure to yourself, why not drain? But, but that's a choice. You you can allow it to drain you or you cannot. Just keep it rolling. Just, just, just. He said, you're drained? That's a choice. You think being physically exhausted is a choice? You think somebody working two jobs, coming home late at night, goes right to bed, doesn't cook or do the dishes? You think that's a fucking you choice? Said hey, everybody was... right now who's struggling and who's really feeling tired because you've got multiple jobs, it's because you choose to be exhausted. You know, I've lived with all different types of people, I swear. I, I always had different roommates in college. Um... For someone who can't stop banging on about women needing to be more feminine, every time I hear Pearl speak, I'm shocked at how incapable of compassion, understanding, or any kind of nuance she seems to be. You know, all of which are traditionally very feminine traits. Um, she genuinely has one of especially when she's like aggressively <laughs> steamrolling over people in conversations. She genuinely has one of the most masculine styles of conversation um, I've, I've ever seen in a woman, which is fine, be how you wanna be. Everyone has, has different personality types and whatever, but maybe don't do that and then lecture the rest of us about how we, we're not submissive and feminine and sweet enough. Meanwhile, you have higher levels of masculinity than probably the average man in 2023. So, you know, that's all I'm saying, mate. It really is a choice at the end of the day. Because and I grew up with nine siblings, nine. I'm telling you, shit can be worked out. This is coming from a girl who grew up in a mansion and has daddy pay all her bills. She's trying to tell you guys where physical exhaustion comes from. The one of the most fucking privileged people in America is telling you physical exhaustion is in your brain. You're imagining it. If Pearl had like worked her way up, if she like lived rough for a few years, if she like really struggled in life, and then was on podcast talking about like the years that she was homeless um, and she, she was also a single mom and like doing all this. I feel like then she could go on a podcast and say, being tired is a choice. But if she like explained like, oh, well, when I was in this really tough situation, like working three jobs with my three year old son who had loads of health issues at the time. When I was going through that really dark place, I was exhausted all the time and I finally got to a breaking point after, you know, a year. I was at in a year and then I was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna, being tired is a choice and I just broke through and even though I was still exhausted, I didn't let, allow myself to feel it. I just push, push, push. If she was like coming from that position, I get it. Okay, that's fine. Go on like Chris Williamson podcast and say, you know, talk about that. That's, that's totally acceptable. But she's just, She's, she's not, she's just saying that. She's just saying that. So it's just, I don't know, I, shut up. <laughs> like every day, every day I realize she's far dumber than I even thought back when I did my video on her. It's incredible. This video's not, I'll stop. This video's not about her, but I'm like, I would have been way meaner in my video on her if I made it now because she's gotten worse or she's revealed how, like she's so dumb. I knew she was dumb, but she's so dumb. It's amazing. She She's so dumb that she debated Ethan Klein and came out of it looking dumb. I don't know how dumb you have to be to make Ethan look good, but I was actually watching it thinking he's not looking so bad in this conversation. I was like, wow, Pearl, wow. That's an achievement. That's a good example. Pearl should be a nepotism case study. 
as dull and uncharismatic as a rock, but with less talent. I just, I'm just not sure I believe that she would be successful, if not of her background, just because she's one of the people I look at and I'm like, how do you tie your shoes? Well, that and her totally shameless ability to grift. Those are the things I think that's led to her success. And she's hardworking, I'll give her that. Um, with like the podcast and the making the shorts, but I just don't know what ability she's got. So yeah, anyway, back to the point, back to the point. I'm not fucking saying being successful is a choice. I'm not saying that. Don't twist my words. It is to some extent. People are right and wrong. This is the thing. I think this is where the conversation goes to hell because both when people go, being successful is a choice, it's up to you, they're right. And when people go, yeah, but there's a whole host of factors that makes it not as easy for some people and for someone who's in an impossible situation to just say that it's not true, they're also right. The problem is you need nuance because there's nuance in these conversations. It's partly true that being successful is a choice. And it's also, do you, I'm not gonna, you know what I'm saying. But I'm not just saying like, believe and then you'll be successful, like like Pearl would or something, you know, don't twist my words. Um, but what I am saying, this is what I'm saying, is I've, I've seen firsthand how that energy and attitude can wield a lot of power. And I've also seen how the opposite of that energy, resentment and believing you don't deserve, and just blaming someone else as a, represent, as a representation of that, whether it's their fault or not, um, it just sabotages you more than anyone else. So I would count self-belief as one of many, like I said, it's that weird self-belief that I can't quite explain that I allude to it. Yeah, but you, I'm just gonna use those, you know what I mean? But that, that self-belief as one of the many factors in privilege. Um, and that belief itself is, it's a difficult skill these people have unknowingly been practicing their whole lives, as I said. Often, which helps, often backed by a brilliant education and family money, which then probably makes you feel even more like, or status, or whatever it happens to be, which adds even more to your... Right, I believe in my... It gives a backing to that. I think that's, like, really helpful, obviously. And I, I'm not being facetious when I say that. That self-belief is genuinely not an easy state to get to, especially depending on what kind of upbringing or education you've had, or, like, that can be really difficult for some people to work through. That's working through a whole lot of stuff. It's not an easy state to get to, I don't think, necessarily, but it's a good state to be in if you can get there. But I understand why people just get annoyed when people go, this attitude's really important to have, because they're just like, F you, like... What do you mean it's easy? Cause, but because people who say that don't then say, but actually getting there oh, that is really difficult. That's why the self-help world is so successful. And like people are looking into that and because people recognize, yes, things will come a lot easier probably if, if I am in that mentality and attitude and in that state, but actually getting there is really the difficult part. And that's why, you know, everyone's got a course now. <laughs> yeah. But truly that's one of the things that I was most envious of. Um, amongst like my amongst my peers and at school and was that attitude that they seemed that most of them not all of them again um, and again I'm seeing like the surface level probably more going on but you know um, but just not, like that confidence that surface level attitude confidence um, even in daily life it's valuable of course that's not the only thing having Johnny Depp as your father also helps if you can manage it but the self-confidence still can't be underestimated as I say I've seen how powerful it can be and the thing is it tricks other people into thinking you must really be something um, because that's what you're exuding you're exuding that people go and of course the right accent and lots of money and all the rest of it can help but that doesn't mean that it can't be done without it and it is it, it is probably true that having grown up with more success and privilege that you're more likely to just be able to stride into a room and just be so super confident and, you know, have people believe that you know what you're doing, what you're talking about. And I've seen, I've seen, I've seen people do that who are really dumb. This is not referring to any of my friends, if any of my friends are watching this, but I have seen people do, who are, who have that, who are really dumb. They were, I'm thinking of one person in particular, I'm like, hmm, okay. Um, and not a particularly nice person either. And just, but had so much status and, uh, and believed and, was convincing um and yeah maybe that's maybe that's how we got politicians because <laughs> they all <laughs> they just believe in themselves and nepotism and secret little handshakes and all the rest of it probably but you know but yeah so, so those things i'm talking about i realized that th these like energies and airs and attitudes or whatever i realized that these are elusive things but that's what i wanted this video to be about because the direct advantages of being a nepo baby are obvious and the internet's been talking about it for ages but it's the other stuff that no one would necessarily notice that i wanted to highlight 
That, and I also wanted to roast some of the dumb things that Neha Baby said because that was fun and I enjoyed it. So when I hear Kendall Jenner and Emma Roberts and Lily Rose Depp talk about how their famous parents didn't help their careers at all, it doesn't irritate me from the perspective of solely their parents, and the fact that they're obviously wrong. Um, it infuriates me also because they are totally blind to the world that they are in. Even without their famous parents, just growing up in that world has given them huge advantages that they cannot see that proximity to power and wealth and success. Um, and in a way, it's kind of not their fault. They literally cannot see what growing up in that world, being educated at the schools they were educated at, along with other famous people, they literally can't see the indirect, more elusive consequences of privilege. The blindness to what you have as being the norm. Like I, I, like I said, I even had part of that. I noticed some part, the lack of it. Like, oh, this... It's really, that's really important, but I think, yeah. I think they're literally, either they're just dumb or I don't know what, but I think that it's so literal. They're thinking, oh, because because my dad didn't pick up the phone and ask the director, that means that he didn't get me this job, therefore I've done it all myself. And to them, that's true, and they can't understand why normal people are losing their minds, saying, what are you talking about? These opportunities would never be presented to us. The only word words for it are out of touch. What impact do you think it has? Even if your parents didn't help you, just the knowledge that it's possible. It's the other thing. You've seen your, you know it's your parents, it's, it's a normal thing to you. You've seen, how, what does that do to you? Even if Johnny Depp has never helped Lily once, unlikely, all right, Lily, but even if, what effect on her do you think it has to be that close to the world of the rich and famous? For it to seem that mundane and normal to her, for it not to be a big deal to know all the movie stars, to not be intimidated or put off by the industry, to already be, you're in it, you're growing up in it, like, how does she not think that's an advantage? Um, you know, and do we think that that has some massive impact on her results, even disregarding her famous parents, to just be known to people in the industry? It's shocking how out of touch they are. Look, and I understand why some of them are getting irritated by the Nepo Baby label because they take it as people accusing them of being untalented and undeserving. And I think actually some of this stems from fear that if they acknowledge and accept and admit, yes, partly I'm only here because of daddy, um, I think part of it... I know I was talking about self-confidence, and but and true, but that doesn't also mean there can't be insecurity in other ways. I think part I think part of it is probably they're worried that if they admit that, maybe even to themselves, who knows? I don't want to be an armchair psychologist, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. Perhaps they're worried that if they admit that, even to themselves, they are insecure about their own abilities, maybe because they have or haven't done enough to prove themselves, or they do doubt what they can do. They then have to admit that a huge part of the reason I'm here, or I literally wouldn't be here at all if not for my parents, do I have any talent? Have I got any talent at all? Am I... Which you can accept both things, but I think it probably takes quite a mature individual to be able to acknowledge and accept, yes, I've been advantaged and privileged, but but also accept, but hang on, but I know I'm talented and I'm skilled and I'm hardworking and I'm going to take this legacy and build on it and I'm going to do... I'm going to prove myself because I know I can and accepting that my parents helped me doesn't negate the fact that I am talented and important and valuable in my own right but I don't think they can quite do that maybe because some of them Kendall 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 aren't actually talented but here's the thing look, nobody nobody serious really I don't think is saying that Nepo babies by default aren't talented and ma many of them are incredibly talented except Pearl um, acknowledging that you had a massive head start doesn't mean that you don't have any talent unless you're Pearl. But I've seen talented kids. I've, I've seen such smart, talented kids never ever get the opportunity to show it, or they believe that that lifestyle is so out of reach they never even try to attain it. People far more talented than Kendall Jenner and Pearl. They can't see the benefits they have because for them it is so, I, I'm mainly taking the piss with Pearl. I'm not saying that she's the same as Kendall Jenner. Or I'm just I'm just joking, okay? I know, I know. And she's, yeah, she's good grifter and she's done a lot of hard work with the YouTube shorts and she's gamed the algorithm and yeah, her dad's helped her a lot, but yeah, you know, she's done her, but okay, she's not the same as Kendall Jenner, but I also just find her super annoying and I'm just taking the piss, so chill out. And also she's, 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 I think she's really unhealthy figure for gender dynamics online. I think she's making it worse. I think she's really dumb. I don't think she understands half the things she talks about. You can, you can see that when people, anyone questions her, any of these numbers and studies she talks to, she has no idea what she's talking about. But anyway, moving on, I've done a video on her to begin with. But yeah, they can't see, um, to Kendall Jenner in particular, I'm talking about. They can't see the benefits they have because for them it's so normal. And to an extent, that's a very normal human thing. You don't know what you don't know. 
However, it is also delusional and their parents have failed them and they should all be assigned a mandatory gratitude course. No, wait, that sounds so LA. I bet they're, they're all already doing gratitude courses, aren't they? And it, it's probably given them a spiritual superiority complex to go along with everything else. Never mind, forget I said anything. Okay, so I've just come across this article. So the photographer that I mentioned at the beginning that Chris Jenner said, the Victoria's Secret photographer that Chris Jenner said that she got in touch with who helped Kendall become like a supermodel in the early stages of career. And like I said, like, oh, which is something totally not available to any random girl is been able to contact a top photographer and get them to help you. So reading this, it's like, I can understand why Kendall and other people think that her fame has actually like made it more difficult for her in some ways and actually she has done it all herself. But it's, but like, it's also so delusional. It's, it's just so frustrating to read this because even though, so this photographer is also still backing up the narrative that yeah, um, Kendall, she's done it all alone because like here he said to Kendall, you're in a very unique position where you already have a brand, whether you care to acknowledge it. It's a lot harder to rebrand than it is to brand. So I think all these like ideas they're telling and like that Kendall's heard is like, oh yeah, it is way harder for me. So just scrolling down, here we've got, okay, okay. So Russell James, he's this photographer. He's, he's, he said, I've seen her put under intense pressure. I've seen her criticized like, oh, you're a model because you're a famous person. It's actually the opposite. Her fame was one of the greatest things she's had to overcome. She got all of her castings as a completely anonymous person. She just went as Kay or Kenny with no makeup. Um, she basically got picked to do shows by big designers who didn't know they were hiring Kendall Jenner. Okay, I think, I, I believe them. I think this, I think a certain level of this is true that they're talking about. But then they think, they take that and they think, oh, that means then that Kendall's actually been hindered. She's been handicapped in the industry. Right, even though, like the photographer is also backing up this narrative. So should we go, should we go, should we go up a bit? What did he say? So he says, he says that her mother reached out and asked to work with her. Again, how, how many, how many, how, who else would he do that for? He's working with her. What's happening there that he's, he's putting all this time and effort into helping Kendall Jenner. So, so he's, he, he was her mentor. This is the thing. So that, oh my God, I'm so frustrated with this. He, this photographer who worked with Victoria's Secret, he was Kendall Jenner's mentor. He helped her at the beginning of her career. And he is also, again, backing up the narrative that Kendall was hindered by her, by her fame, not seeing the bloody irony, but just access to him, him being in her life, him mentoring her, him helping her was in and of itself because of who she was and her fame. So he's like saying, oh yeah, her fame didn't help her. But it's like, mate, even the fact that you were helping her, you being in her life was because of who she was. So he's saying, um, all I could think of to do at the time is to try and make sure to offer guidance and support because any bad move can rule someone out. And he's, he's giving her advice. Um, and he's saying, for example, discussing the relationship to her brand in our meeting, I said we have to take her move to modeling to an almost anonymous level. Like he's giving her all this advice. He's like, from what it sounds like, he's babying her through the f first stages of her career. So he says, Kendall had said that she loved doing philanthropic work. So I said, let's go do some projects based on that. We'll take some pictures for picture's sake and not for any commercial concern. We went to Australia, met with some Aboriginal girls in the outback. Kendall did a small Miss Vogue cover, which was an online only young version of Vogue in Australia. How many other people, if you live in America, how many people can afford to fly out to bloody Australia just to take some bloody photos? Are you bloody joking me, Russell? Are you, jo are you joke? What is this? And to be, then be, how did you do that, Russell? Is it because, I don't know, mate, did you have maybe some, have some contacts in Australia or, or in the magazine industry or who was like, oh, wow, this is Russell James, a, a, a top photographer who's worked with Victoria's Secret. Sure, Russell, we'll put your photographs on the cover of this small Miss Vogue um, online only young kids Vogue thing in Australia. Like acting like, acting like, you, so you also say that her fame was something she had to overcome. Meanwhile, you and your connections, how would she get that, have got that cover in the first place? How would she even have flown out? You see all these little things that are adding up that it's like, oh my God, I'm just, this is the most frustrating thing. And he helped her get a agent. We started talking about agents and the importance of getting the right one. Okay, he's talking about how you need the right agent. Um... And then he's saying these agents understand fame is only going to go so far. To be a real model, it takes a whole lot of other things to happen. Probably true, but you were one of those things, Russell. She's gone, she's, she went from, okay, she's gone from 20 million to 100 million followers. Yeah, that's really impressive. That's well done, Kendall, for doing that. But she had 20 million in the first place because of who I found. I'm so frustrated reading this. And I think, I, here's the problem. I think they kind of think that 
because this is true, I think she probably did just pretend she was Kay or Kenny with no makeup going to random castings. But she was mentored by Russell James. Her parent, her family, whether alleged, allegedly, allegedly, whether this happened or not, I mean, you know what my opinion of it is, but whether she did actually have any plastic surgery or not, um, her family can definitely afford, could definitely afford for her to have that. We've seen her on Keeping Up With The Kardashians meeting with agents and getting little roles or whatever. Clearly her mother has and to manage to get Russell James to so to mentor her to such an extent where he's flying out with her to Australia to take photos of her to get her on the covers of the and even if that's the case that some people didn't know they were hiring quote unquote Kendall Jenner of course it then got to the stage where one of the main reasons she's successful now is because she's a Kardashian is because she's like a package deal with the rest of them so even if some jobs she got were her trying to be anonymous and then they cast her that doesn't mean that she would have become the highest supermodel in the world if she wasn't who she was. But the problem is, I think because in their mind, they're so blind to like this world of privilege. They're so blind to all these little benefits. They're so out of touch that she thinks, oh, but because I did some auditions and I was just pretending to be Kay or Kenny and, and I hid my name, therefore it was harder for me. And she genu- this is the actual thing. This is why it's that she genuinely believes that and he believes that. He's saying it's the opposite. It's the opposite. Oh, her fame actually was the opposite. It was one of the greatest things she's had to overcome. Wow. And because there's a level of truth to that, that it can sometimes be hard to rebrand, I think she's actually delusional enough and genuinely believes that it's been harder for her. And that is amazing to me because it's just... And the other thing that annoys me that I want to say as well is what the thing that I think the noise about all the Nepo babies, like Lily Rose Depp saying that, you know, she feels like she's had to work twice as hard and Kendall Jenner saying it's been harder for her in, in many ways to make it in the industry. The reason why this winds people up so much is because they are perfectly happy to claim all the benefits of being a Nepo baby, but they want to pretend that they did it all themselves. You can't have both, actually. And I think that's kind of the same reason why a lot of people dislike uh, Meghan and Harry is the they kind of um not wanting to be associated with the royal family which is fine that's fair enough if you want to remove yourself from that but at the same time maybe then don't take take british taxpayer money if you you know you lose the privilege of that and maybe don't keep the titles and maybe don't move to america and be in loads of documentaries and stuff when at the same time claiming you want privacy and you don't want it's like you can't have both people don't like it when you can't have your cake and eat it and this is why with all these people i think this is why they're disliked or they annoy people and get on people's nerves because you can't have both um, if you want to go in completely alone and do it yourself, Kendall, then don't springboard off your reality show where we see you talking to agents, people get, okay, don't use your parents' connections to meet photographers in the industry, don't do all of that, and Lily Rose Depp, don't be in the first two, in films with your dad, don't be the main, um, model closing the Chanel fashion show, um, and allow all the magazines to print headlines with Johnny Depp's daughter, don't do all that, say but but you're willing to take that you're perfectly willing to take all of it and be like oh thank you very much but then turn around and go but i've done it all myself it was the same for me you cannot have both there are pros and cons to everything the pro of being a nepo baby is that you have all these advantages and legs up the con is that if you do make it um it's it's never it might not be the same level as someone who makes it on their own and and both of those things have upsides and downsides but you pick pick your poison basically because you can't actually have both you can't have your cake and eat it too and it's incredibly normal when you pretend because because you're happy to accept the benefits that's what pisses people off so much you're not you 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 go oh i hate when people call me an epa baby you don't because you accept the benefits if you really hated it you wouldn't accept the privileges but you do so if you're going to accept the privileges that's fine but then you've got to take the other stuff with it and acknowledge that you have had privileges you cannot have both and this is what's just winding me up so much about them so yeah this is my take on nepo babies um a lot of them are embarrassing some of them are untalented all of them are privileged but if they haven't done anything wrong hating them for things they can't control is a little bit gross and let's be honest if you were in their position you'd probably behave no differently yeah but i think a lot of people when they criticise the the Nepo, the little Nepo baby, it makes it sound cute, doesn't it, the Nepo babies? Um, <laughs> I think I think a lot of people who hate the Nepo babies, not criticise the Nepo babies, but hate the Nepo babies, or the privileged or whatever, are just mad it's not them. That, out of context, sounds really bad, but I hope, given in the context of what I'm talking about and the attitude I'm talking about, 
<laughs> doesn't sound so bad. But look, there's, there's obviously, there's nothing wrong with pointing out that obviously they have a massive advantage, but let's not pretend that some of them aren't also hardworking and talented and grateful for the leg up they had, because there are them too. I just, I just think, this is what I'm saying, a distinction should be made between the state of being a Nepo baby, which is a morally neutral state. There is nothing either right or wrong or good or bad about being a Nepo baby. The Nepo baby simply is. So a distinction between that, the state of being a Nepo baby, which doesn't deserve any criticism, um, and the criticism-worthy behaviour, sometimes associated, ingratitude, blindness, and out of touch, oblivious behaviour um, that Nepo babies demonstrate when they fail to acknowledge their advantages. And they go on talk shows and say dumb things like, um, yeah, so... Actually, being Kardashian made getting into modeling a little, a little bit harder for me. I think it is unreasonable to hate someone for having advantages they can't control, no matter how unfair those advantages may be. However, I think it is reasonable to expect that person with those unfair advantages to acknowledge and be grateful for them, and if they aren't, and pretend they've had it just as hard as people without them, and seem to be not at all grateful for all the ways in which the gods have blessed them, then it is reasonable to give them a reality check and tell them to shut up and go away. Especially if they use those unfair advantages to the full and mostly cruised along on them with little talent of their own. Unless... Speak I hope this is not controversial, unless it's Brooklyn Beckham, right? Listen, no, hear me out. Don't burst his little Nepo baby bubble. Let's humor him. That's like a forest drink. There's like so many like different greens and stuff in there. Let him pretend that he's a real chef. It's adorable to watch. I pour about that much and then we get the limes nice and thin. Oh, I'm a nutter in the kitchen. I swear to God, I'm not even joking. He taps into something maternal because when I heard him in an interview talking about his shitty book of photography so proudly with all the simple joy of someone who's never realised they have zero talent, someone just happy to be here, I felt like a hopeful child had just presented me with the worst drawing I'd ever ever seen in my life, but with such trust in their eyes as they look to me for love and approval. And all I wanted to say was, Wow, Brooklyn, did you photograph that elephant all by yourself? <gasps> that's so, oh, that's so, oh, that's so good, isn't it? Isn't it? That's, no, that, I, no, I, pr I swear, I promise. P proper, that is so, oh, that, no, that, Mm, that's so good. That's, wow. Looking at that, I think you could be a real photographer when you grow up. Oh, wow, that's like, that's, that's so good. No, it's, no, no, darling, it's so good, darling. No, don't be upset. No, it's so good. Oh, no, 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 I promise. No, I, no, no, I actually think, no, it's amazing. No, I will, I will, I will, I will, you're right, I will hang it up on the wall. Where everyone, yeah, where everyone can see it when they come into that. No, I will. Pro no, I promise, darling, don't, no, that's, no, darling, it's amazing. No, I'm so proud of you. That's, that's in a published, it's in a published book, by the way. It's, it, it, he published that in his photography book. Yeah, so basically, and you all have to be on on this, I'm advocating for Nepo baby self-awareness, except when it comes to Brooklyn Beckham. I'm recommending that we give him a dispensation on account of the fact that he is obviously a golden retriever, only pretending to be a real boy. I don't know if anyone's ever had canned lychee. It is so good. You guys should try it. Um, and we should all keep telling him that he is the goodest boy in the world and clap every time he retrieves a stick, like he solved the cure for world hunger. Let him think he's helping. Makes me happy to see him happy. I'm very happy with it. You're, you're very special, Brooklyn. You're very, you're very special little boy. And your success has nothing to do with David and Victoria. Okay? Don't, don't, no, we don't listen to all those nasty people who say such things. They're just wrong. Right? And, and I've just got a special message that me, your mummy and daddy, and everybody else here today, we just want you to know that we love you very much. I used to love going to the pubs with my friends. But... 
Yeah. Bless. Oh, I'm a nutter in the kitchen. That old philosophical question. Is ignorance bliss? Is it better to know reality and be miserable? Or live in a fantasy and be content? Oh, well. Take the blue pill, Brooklyn. Do it. Be happy, my darling, in the Nepo baby delusion matrix and never search for the truth. It's better for everyone that way. Well, thank you for watching, everyone. Um, comment your favourite Nepo baby down below. Mine is Jamie Lee Curtis. Don't know if you've heard of her. She's kind of a rising star. <laughs> Look after yourselves. You're, you're very special, Brooklyn. You're very, you're very special little boy. <laughs> what the fuck? You're very special, Brooklyn. You're, you're a very special little boy. <laughs> <laughs> he is though. He's like a little boy. It's actually really adorable, but at the same time. <laughs> I used to love going to the pubs with my friend 